Yes. Uh, I'm just going to open us up in prayer real quick. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for uh, all that you did today in that prayer meeting, Lord. I thank you for, uh, we know everything is yes and amen. So, Lord, I just thank you for, for all those prayers that, that, that got brought forward today, Lord. And, and I thank you for that. And I thank you already. I know in advance you got a great teaching from Rick today, Lord. I just pray that it, it saturates into our hearts, Lord, and changes us from the inside, Lord. We're thanking you already because we know you're going to move at the altar call for those who need prayer afterwards, too, as well, Lord. And I just pray that this uh, this teaching sparks in a few people to get into their ministry, to start their walk going forward into this, Lord, to see people get set free. There's nothing better in the kingdom other than winning people to the to the kingdom, Lord. Getting them set free is right up there with it. So, Lord, we're so thankful for all that you're going to do today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I want to help you best I can so that you can not only go through self-deliverance, but help other people get delivered. If you only get delivered, that's only the beginning stages of it. You're supposed to help people. And what you'll find is when you lead people to the Lord and they're brand new, they are so easy to get delivered. Now, it is harder, but hey, when they take off, Christians who've been saved for 15 years, they'll, they'll grow really fast. You'll see some wonderful things, but they are harder to work with because they were accountable for much. And then when you give place to the devil, then you're going to reap what you sow. And so we're unwinding these believers, and it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of patience. And uh, you got to be led by the Spirit, because if you're led by your flesh, it can be really frustrating. I was trying to do the math. A six-month period, I, I, I was doing, there are uh, seven days a week. Oh, man, I was doing like 25 hours of deliverance a week for six months straight. So I, I've, not to say that I haven't learned it all, but I've learned everything you need to know to be very effective in deliverance. If you can get this down, you'll be fine. And you'll, the more you go through deliverance and the more that you help people, it comes down, it's, it's, it's hard, but it's pretty simple. I mean, the devil's not working with hieroglyphics. You know, it takes, it takes some super faith to breathe, believe the hieroglyphics of Joseph Smith that he was reading in Golden Tablets. Boy, I take some faith. This only takes childlike faith is that we have to stop sinning. We have to stop grumbling and complaining. That's a high offense to God. S Satan was always symbolic of a snake and a scorpion. Well, what came out of the wilderness to bite the, the Israelites, the Jews, and kill them? It was snakes when they grumbled and complained. So when you grumble and complain, pretty soon you'll, you'll have doubt at some level. Pretty soon you'll stop believing certain things. As you progress, you'll have bitterness. Then you'll be resentful. And then you have to blame everybody else because it can't be you because the devil's the master of deception. So he deflects it upon everybody else. Hey, if you weren't molested at five, you'd be fine. And now you're 40. Now, you got to get over being molested at five, but that's past tense. That's before you were saved. Now you're an adult. That was a child. Yes, of course, it's easy to wound a child, right? It's easy to scar them. It's easy to, to freak them out. That's why horror movies are so, you know, they're very dangerous. So a lot of people are still scared of the dark. They're still scared of the wilderness. I mean, one time I had to the Lord will sit you down and you can conquer your fears. One time I, I crashed. I was going to do a little test ride. I was staying at my buddy's cabin up uh, south of, of uh, Prescott. And it was right before dusk. I was kind of map, mapping out a little trail to take. And I went down this road. I thought it was a, I thought it was a UTV road, ATV road, but it was one for cutting in the road to get to uh, cutting down the trees. Anyway, when I tried to get back up, I had to jump off the ATV, the four-wheeler, went rolling down a hill, took me three, about two hours to pull it out with all my might. I was so gassed. Then when I got on it, I found that there was a, a tree blocking the road. And uh, so I had to walk back, but didn't know my way back. And now I'm walking and it's pitch dark. Well, the Lord sat me down 
man, you hear all kinds of animals when it's pitch dark. <laughs> and I was like, well, no time to be fearful. I got flip flops on. So I'm like, well, I can't be fearful. I'm going to bust my toe. I just have to kind of walk like a duck here when I'm sensing rocks. And then I started thinking about my life and about my attitude and how I just got caught up in the world. I was a Christian. I was blessed in my finances. The Lord was opening the windows of heaven. But I was taking my eyes off what he called me to do. He blessed my finances so that I could be a light, that I could go and do this ministry. But then I let the gift of God grow out of control so the devil will even work with good things. And I was unwise to the schemes of the devil. Well, the Lord sat me down. The next day I was able to go back and in the light, yeah, there was a big tree in the middle of the trail, but just 40 yards, 30 yards right down the hill was the actual road to get home. And it was, you know, the road had looped around. I had to start from the top, but the road was easy to see when you come in the light. So God's trying to bring you into the light. That's what deliverance is. You have to come in the light. So if you see everything negative, then, you know, that's, that's flesh. You know, that's doubt. That's unbelief. Now, there's negative things going in the world. Um, and it, it's, it's pressing times. I mean, I was going to read the lyrics to the song 50 Cent, Many Men. So they've appointed Trump as the savior now. And he comes out to a gangster song where 50 Cent is rapping about putting people in the head and killing them numerous times, dropping 25 curse words in there. And he's came out with the pimp strut after getting shot. So if God saved you and you had knowledge that Jesus saved you, say Brother Joe was uh, in an accident and he received this miracle from Jesus and now all his limbs and feet and, and legs where they said you might be paralyzed. You think Brother Joe's going to then come into any place with a gangster anthem? <laughs> no, it wouldn't cross his mind. It wouldn't cross my mind either. And so it shows you that, that there are strong delusions that are already happening. They're already happening. And I'm not against, hey, I, I mean, got to switch this thing up. These people hate God that are in office now. They hate God. They'll let you know we hate God. And we don't care if you don't like we hate God, right? They're in your face. So I'm not against voting, praying, certainly, but it's when you put your trust. And, and when you put your trust in man throughout the Bible, you, you get a curse because it's the opposite of trusting God is trusting man. Now, should you get insight from man? Yeah, the, one of the key things we're going to talk about, if you want your life changed, you're going to have to now have a, a, a cloud of great witnesses around you. You're going to have to be a part of the body of Christ. And a lot of people get in deliverance say, well, I'm not going back to that church. They don't understand about deliverance. And what you really have to understand is a lot of them are super overcomers and, and have a lot of favor with God that they don't know about deliverance, yet they can get people saved on a regular basis, that they can love these people and labor with these people. And yeah, are they able to do everything they could, they could do? No, but they're doing something for the Lord. They love the Lord. They believe in the Bible. They're trusting in the word. So it shows you all your good gifts come out of your spirit, man. What comes out of your flesh can't be trusted. That's why you have to renew your mind and take your thoughts captive and be obedient to the spirit. And a lot of them are. And so there's good things happening. So you can't. Oh, and then a lot of people go through some deliverance for a few weeks. You feel great and you want to go back and fix your pastor who was trying to <laughs> fix your knucklehead for 30 years. And you're not giving him the same grace he gave you. And so so I, I kind of was a little bit like that. And it always got me in trouble. You know, and, and I saw it as a as kind of a battle, which it kind of was. I was in the jail and I would even go into these sex offenders. I'm seeing. I mean, I hear some stories in here that are pretty similar to what you hear in jail, but not the sex offenders. Those stories at one point I had to say, bro, this was my out. They warn us as you have to go through a six hour training every year to go in there and preach. And I said, hey, don't tell me too much because they could subpoena me and I'd have to be a witness against you because I at one point. This is not going to do me any good to hear this stuff. I'm going to look at you and like, oh, man, here comes Fruit Loop Supreme. Like, jeesh. But what happened was God had changed these guys who were doing very vicious things sexually. 
And then it all made sense is, hey, they violated the word of God, whether they were unsaved or whether they were saved, it doesn't matter. A man will reap what he sows. It's a spiritual law. And so all of them, 100% of them had a connection with porn before any real dark deviance whatsoever. So porn is the hook, the place. And then where a drug them was very, very vicious. And if they were molested, we know that sins can come down into your life, demons through victimization. Then those demons later in life, when they fueled them supremely with porn, they could do very dark and deviant things. Why? Because you become so carnal, you become such a pleasure seeker that you're looking for that pleasure. You're looking for that orgasm. Well, you used to get it here. Now the devil in his hold say, now you get it here. Well, it works the same thing, whether it's pride. Hey, you used to feel good because you had a job and you had a nice car and your teeth were straight and white, whatever. Well, now you need more money, right? Now you need more vacations. You need more social media. You need more people patting you on your back because he puts the holds on you and he brings you down to depths. And during this process, it says he blinds the minds of those that believe not. So the minute you start letting the devil control you, by definition, you believe not. And they can't see how bad it is. Brother Pete's my, my right-hand guy. We go in every uh, Monday to preach a couple services in the jails. And uh, he said he was homeless. And at one point, he was a drug profiteer, selling drugs, making all this money and having all these friends and all these possessions. And then he had a all work for food sign. And he was so whacked out that he was sleeping on a bench and he didn't even know what he looked like. He thought he really appeared to people like, hey, they think I'm gonna work. You know, how am I gonna tell them when I really don't wanna work? I just need this 20 bucks for my next hit. But he thought he looked okay. And then one time he went into a Circle K, he was buying some drinks or something, and he, they had a camera you could see from the back, the back view, and he noticed he had a big bald head. And he goes, what is this, man? I'm not bald up here. So there was a little bit of fuzzy. And he goes, man, that camera's broke. <laughs> and, and, and I go, that's funny you remember that, but that's more symbolic than you think it is because that's the delusion you could not tell that this has now been years. You're going through male pattern baldness, and when you see it, you can't even believe it's you, right? So that's symbology, I told him, of the blindness of time going by, of the hardness of heart, of things decaying right before your eyes, but you can't see it. And most of the times, men can't see their relationships with their wives and children are decaying. They're busted, and uh, they're, they're not fruitful. There's no trust. They can't see it. Men come in. It's always the same. And I, I take the perspective from my church. They always said, hey, when there's a problem in the relationship, it always it, it stems from the man. So I take that mindset because he's to be the spiritual leader. Well, you have women that get saved first. You, you, you get men that aren't saved. Or, and, and so things are really busted up. But ultimately, at one point, the man has to rise up and, and, and be a leader. But the point is, whether I'm talking to the woman or I'm talking to the man, they're coming from a perspective of how it's the other person's fault. That, that's just always the way it is. My husband, this is what he does. He's breaking me down. One, two, three, four. Here's the reasons why. This is my wife. She's crazy. She won't let me go. Uh, you know, I have no life. I'm suffocated. But always these ex excuses. Well, what you have to do when you're helping someone, you have to see, show them where they're blind. Because if you just tell them they're wrong, they, they, they can't receive that because they're already blinded. So you have to show them the word. You have to show them some things they're saying from the perspective of the word to show that, that they are blinded. So I'm going to do some stuff today where, where you can ask some questions, but you have to take on the mindset. This is the deliverance training. So this isn't super training how you can get super delivered. That, that's what we're doing every Thursday and Friday. This is for you to help people. And uh, one thing you have to realize is, is the spirit world controls the natural world. That, that's a fact. Christians are led by the spirit. They're controlled by the Holy Spirit, the word of God. And sinners are controlled by the spirit of the world. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. He has the ability to persuade them uh, through their wants, desires, and carnal nature. So you're going to serve someone. So since the spiritual world or the world, natural world is controlled by the spiritual world, you're going to be controlled by someone. 
Those are facts. Most people are oblivious. They think they're just neutral. Well, this is just kind of a down season. I'm not hearing much from the Lord. You know, this is, this is a time where, you know, I'm just pressing through. No, there's always a spiritual force in control of your life. And, uh, and the demons are fine with you just serving yourself. And uh, Proverbs chapter 28 verse 1 says, The wicked flee when no one pursues them. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. So there, in order to be delivered, you have to have some boldness. Now, I'll admit, there's some people that are in uh, really bad shape. And I even say to myself, is this guy going to get delivered? And, uh, and I'm thinking, he is a wreck. I don't see a lot of godly sorrow. Um, doesn't really understand how many people he's really hurt. And ultimately, who he really hurt was the Lord. But here's all the people that are tangibly in his path to look back and reflect on. And he has no remorse for that. Well, I would assume you have no vision that all sin hurts God. So when they get delivered, a lot of times I'm amazed. But I come into it with a boldness. And I come into it with an expectation that they are going to get delivered. And so when I come with that approach and... uh, you know, Mike kind of, Mike taught it to me because I, I was working when we first opened this up. This is when I started doing the one-on-one six or seven years ago when we got this building. And I would come from work and uh, in construction, I've never met, <laughs> I, I've, I've seen a few crews that are pretty functional and, and pretty in order, but most construction crews, you're doing a lot of management with people. And, and a lot of them have given up on life because not, not completely, but they've given up, let's say, on their dreams. And so that since they don't have any dreams, working is just to pay the bills at this point. Ah, I got to put in some extra time. I need a new transmission. Ah, ah, my wife is complaining. I got to redo this or that. And so it's never out of a expectation to build. So you have to kind of build them up, encourage them. And I would come in here And then some people would be, you know, they they would, you know, their demons flare up, basically. And some would say, I said, well, do you have spirits? I don't know, man. You're the man of God. You tell me. You know, this is supposed to be the house of deliverance. You're the man of God. So you tell, do I got demons? I don't know. My pastor told me I needed to talk to you. So tell me. I'm like, man, this dude, I got to be better off at work than talking to this guy. (laughs) Like he has no sense, spiritual discernment, you name it. But Mike taught me that, hey, when you come here, he said, this is how I do it. And, and he was transparent. He goes, hey, there's a lot of times I've came down to the center, whether it was to preach or whether it was to help someone. And I didn't want to go in my flesh, but I already signed up for the mission. So I don't allow my flesh to talk to me. I shut it down on my way here. And then when I get here, I've, I say to the Lord, what can I do over these next two hours Everything I can do, I'm willing to do it to help this person. And I said, oh, okay. Hey, all right. Well, I thought you were Superman. I thought you, (laughs) Karen gave you a kiss and a hug and made you a little paper sack lunch. And you were whistling Dixie all the way down here. No, no, he's, we're all real men and real women. And we go through real struggles and of this world. And we eat by the sweat of our brow. Nothing comes easy. So... I said, okay, I'm going to take that approach. And when I just did that, a lot of the flare-ups of the spirits uh, would stop. And, uh, and so of the people saying strange things or, hey, what, 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 hey, I was talking to Mike Smith. What, you're here? He's not here. Where's he at? What room's he in? Why are we going down here? <laughs> that that kind of stopped but because the devil knew that irritated me. Like, bro, man, I make money. I'm coming here to help you. You're, you're jammed up. I'm not jammed up. And I gave you two hours. You didn't sign up. We're not getting paid. So how about show a little respect? You know, this is where carnal things in my mind. So the minute I came with the mindset, okay, I got to be a servant. Well, that shuts down my carnal attitude. And the devil's looking to throw fiery darts. Well, he's looking where he can throw them. You know, if you have frustration, if you have doubt, if you have unbelief, if you have fear, well, you, you, you're going through 
deliverance, right? So you might have some of that stuff. That doesn't exclude you from being as bold as a lion. When the ministry starts, you got to put your cares of this world. You got to put your, your fears aside, your, your insufficiencies. You got to put them aside and say, hey, Lord has appointed me for this time to help somebody. And I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. You'll find out if you just take that approach, it'll eliminate the majority of distractions and, and you can you can stay focused. Then in return, you have to have that mindset of being bold. God wants you to believe. He told you to do it. The sign of a believer, not the apostle, pastor, preacher, teacher would cast out demons, but the believer would cast out demons. So then you have to realize you have to use your faith, not faith of, wow, I've been through so many hours of deliverance. I should be able to get this demon out of this person. I've fasted so much. I should be able to get the demon out of this person because I've tried those. I mean, I went on long fast. I'm like, Lord, what's the deal? I fasted that long and they're not coming out faster. This should be like butter. But what I realized is, no, what cast out demons is faith. Why? Because faith enacts the miracles. Deliverance is a miracle. So you believe God wants that person delivered. You believe at the name of Jesus, demons have to flee. So all I got to get the person to do is believe some truth and repent. So coming down to the simplicity now, he's got to believe. He's got to believe God wants to help him. There are a lot of people I get delivered. They still don't think they have any demons, but they know they have problems. So they're at least when you love them and there's the anointing there, they'll say, hey, okay, you know, this could be spirits because what you're saying, hey, this is, we try to show them, hey, this is now a pattern in your life. You've been depressed now on and off for 20 years. This is not any fruit of, of the spirit. You know, this is, this has to do with sin, right? This, this is a, Hey, you best believe if you go bust up a good relationship or fight with your loved ones, you're going to be depressed. That's natural depression to teach you. Don't treat people that way because you're going to suffer loss. You go crazy at work and get fired. Yeah, you're going to be depressed for a little bit. That's not even demonic depression. Like you should be down. You lost a good job because you were led by your flesh. You said some things to, to discredit their trust in you. And now you're suffering that, right? But when you're constantly depressed over and over again, well, you can mostly show a person just through the scriptures, this isn't a fruit of the spirit. And so since you prayed about it and many people prayed for you and you want it gone, but it won't leave by the process of elimination, it leads to, it must be spiritual. And that's one of the, the opposite also a lot of times it is spiritual and there are spirits, but the whole root system is the person's rebellion, the person's unwillingness to yield or believe the word of God. So if you go and just try to cast that devil out without getting them to repent and see the truth of the scripture, you're going to see this, the person then as he's taken the word for granted, he's taken the conviction of the Holy Spirit for granted by definition of his continued suffering and sin, he will take deliverance for granted. It, 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 you you got to trust me, they'll do it. And so now they're, they're taking the word of God, they're taking the conviction of God and deliverance for granted. That person is in great danger because what left is there then? And so you have to get the person to repent. And uh, in order to repent, then you have to change your ways. You have to change your life. I talked about it two weeks ago. King Asa was a good king in 2 Chronicles uh, 14 through 16. And he was upright all his life. And uh, it said he was a good king the whole time he reigned. And what he did when he first took over as king, he got rid of all the idols. And so you might not think your television is an idol. You might not think your bridge club is an idol. You might not think... You know, your fishing hobby is an idol. You might not think your kids are an idol and there are eight sports that you travel around hoping they're going to be the next pro when you know you did not pass that DNA down and you're investing 20000 a year. My buddy, I'm speaking to him, not you. He was five foot six and his daughter was in volleyball and they're spending 20000 and broke a year for her to what? Hopefully make the high school team? That becomes idolatry. Sports are fine, but when your DNA and your skill level and your persistence, you know, run its course, then you got to go on to something else. You can't just keep, you know, it becomes an idol. You know, sports 
are idols. I mean, if you see the people, I don't like going to the Cardinals. It's a bunch of idol followers. They worship men, grown men who think they're gangster, wear the names and numbers of another man on their back, which is not gangster. That, that would be the opposite. And then the men watch these women that are, you know, pretty much half naked, kicking their legs in the air, and then they rotate them around. I've been to one Cardinal game. Two, I sat one in the lower level where you could see all the debauchery. But it's, it's complete ridiculous. I'm not against sports. I'm not against you watching the Cardinals, but it becomes an idol and uh, it'll control you. And uh, many men will testify to it that, hey, you watch a good game and then you kind of have a yearning for another. Well, there's the games that start at 10 o'clock. There's the games start at 1 to 3 and then there's night games. So you can find yourself watching games all day long. So when you tell people that they have to repent of things, you have to show them because if you just tell them, hey, this, this looks like an idol, you're, you have an idol and wish that your, your kid will be what, what you were or what you, know, you could have been. Well, you have to show them like, wait a minute, you said you're struggling financially. You, know, you need to be a, a, a wise servant with your money. You know, this is how much money are you spending here? Okay, how much time is this? Okay, you're not going to church because you got these nine games and these season tickets. I mean, you, you got to not tell them, you have to show them. And so the Holy Spirit will always convict someone of sin if they're God seekers. If they can't even feel the conviction of sin, that doesn't mean I won't try deliverance because some people are so jacked up that, yeah, they, they've went to the, they, they were clean. They, they, they were like the sow that was clean and went back to the mire. They were like the dog that vomited and ate it. A woman came in like that Thursday. I mean, she was already like this when she walked right in. It was 30 minutes into deliverance. I mean, these demons are spinning her around. The minute I put her, my hands on her, she's contorting and flipping all over. Look down. She had blood on her shorts. Her friend had said she started going through some deliverance. I said, how'd she get here? She said, we came here from out of state to get some deliverance and to go to a drug rehab. She left and I was driving by and saw her at the bus stop as a homeless wanderer. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, you know, that person was now, now you got to rescue some people with deliverance. I mean, there's a rescue deliverance because now those devils are rolling. You know, uh, all women on the streets, it is a sick world. I mean, guys drive around naked and, and give them money as they drive by doing sex outs on themselves. That's like the intro to the person. It's like the bait. They all take it. Like, I never thought about being a prostitute. I hate stinky men. I don't like greasy men. Ever since I was a little girl, I had a greasy neighbor. But I would take the money from these men that were doing these things in their car. And there was no touch. And I needed the money. It seemed like just, just taking it. Well, the devil's smart. Pretty soon, they got in those cars. Pretty soon, they were doing things. And often before even that, they had boyfriends or lovers that were only boyfriends or lovers in order to get the drugs. So that was already a form of prostituting what you really were about, what you liked, what you wanted to get drugs. So the system was already rooted in there, and then boom. So it's very, it's a very, sharp free fall when a woman starts prostituting herself because the, the spirits that come from these men are so vicious and then the woman becomes the conduit of demons she becomes like the beehive she 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 holds all the nectar and honey from the demons and then when the John that's just trying it he's just tired of porn now now he needs hookers according to his chain from Satan and he goes and he he sleeps with a hooker he's coming back with hell when you sleep with hookers, you are a sick person. And I don't care who you are, you must go through deliverance. Now, could God mercifully in a four-day repentance and weeping and crying deliver you? Yeah, I, I believe weeping and crying, the breaking of your flesh and the breaking of the hardness of your heart is deliverance. But that person must go through deliverance because he has done many violations. The sexual sin is the obvious the breaking down of his conscience. Now to hurt someone, to pick up a prostitute is to hurt a prostitute, is to hurt a woman. That's the opposite of what God called men to do. We were be the, to be the providers and to be the protectors and to be, you know, uh, 
we were supposed to have women's back, not to contribute in their demise and destruction. So they have to go through deliverance. And those people, you know, it's kind of funny that uh, I'll, I'll see people um, sometimes, uh, real often when it was just me and Kelly and Mike, I would see, uh, you know, Mike would say, hey, I've tried with this guy a couple times, can you help him out? And then some people say, Mike is so intense, man. I can't get, I can't get, uh, you know, the way he looked me in my eye and then started yelling at me. And I would hear it every once in a while. And he was all happy, you know, drinking his quick trip cup 15 minutes before. And I'm like, man, he's yelling in there. And then one day I said, well, hey, what was over there? He goes, yeah, some people. And he started going to this teaching thing. Like, I thought he was all amped up because by the time I get to yelling, I've been working. Now I'm on this plateau and you can get yelled at. So I'm thinking he's up here. And he goes, no, some people, you, you, you got to yell at them because they just won't listen. <laughs> and I realized, oh, he just clicked into that, stared him down and started yelling at him. He told this one, one lady, uh, I was shocked, and she came in for delivery. Mike uh, didn't even tell me I had he, she, he had seen her before, so I'm trying to help her, and and I'm kind of daydreaming because she just was like a bandsaw, like bang, this thing's just going. I'm just <laughs> I'm just listening, kind of blinking. And I'm thinking, man, you know, this lady's real pretty, you know, for her age, but boy, I wouldn't want to be her husband, man. This would be tough to take. <laughs> listening to this, well, anyway. She gasses out a little bit and tells me she saw Mike. I said, well, what'd Mike say? What, what, what happened? Why didn't you get deliverance? Because he pulled out a trash can and he said, unless you throw all your Christianity, everything you learn into this trash can, I can't help you. And I was like, oh, wow, man, this makes sense. Because she's got bits and pieces. She had bits and pieces of so many things, but no Nothing had rooted into real truth. Nothing had rooted into real fruit bearing. But it was a ton of knowledge. It was a ton of partial truth. And, and that's the way she kind of spoke from. To me, that's why I couldn't stay focused and was daydreaming. Because it would only go so far and then it would go to something else. So I, I realized and then, then I said to her, I said, okay. And I got a little more revelation Okay, this is why he told you this. Because you're not rooted and grounded in love. You're not rooted and grounded with faithfulness. You're not rooted and grounded in trust. And therefore, all that half-hearted stuff has to be thrown in the trash. And the fact that you took offense to what he was saying, thinking that he was telling you to throw out your, your, your walk with Jesus, your, your born-again experience, was complete nonsense. He would have never asked you to do that. And in return, as she kept going, she became more patient and, and talked less and, and even dressed different. And, you know, to where it would be representative of, of a married woman, etc. And so God will bring the change, but sometimes you do have to be hard. You have to be hard, not with everybody, because they, they, they can't take it. That was one of my buddies problems and, and me and Mike worked with him for years. He had a great anointing. He had a great heart for God. And I got him in the jails, but he kept trying to deliver everyone from demons every single service. And I said, bro, this isn't a deliverance ministry, man. We're preaching the gospel. We're trying to get these people saved. You're preaching a little bit about the gospel. And then you're preaching a whole lot about deliverance, which is in the gospel, but they don't have the basic foundation. And since they don't have the basic foundation of the gospel, they can't receive this. And of course, there's somebody in the audience that would, that would get delivered every time because there was someone that was rooted and grounded enough and could understand the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And in return, it would convince him that what he was doing was right. Because it is true, you can't get everybody delivered, even if they're on that level, because some aren't ready, some aren't willing. And some are rebelling against it. Some are fearful of the commitment of what is, you know, required after they receive a deliverance. So in return, he burned out a lot of those guys. And, and, and they would write, even, I got letters, I think I threw them away. They're like, please come back. He means well, 
but we need a little love in here, man. This is a hard place in jail. We're sitting in this little cubicle. It's cold in here all the time because they, they got those ACs at 72, and it's all brick building. It's cold. It's, nobody's happy in there. You know, there's people coming and going, people detox, and the guards don't have any love because they've been burned out by all the trickery and shenanigans of, of other inmates before them, and they needed to hear some love. They needed to hear some encouragement. So you have to have some discernment. You know, who needs love and encouragement before the deliverance? Who needs to be confronted? And, and, and you need to be in their grill. You know, like, hey, you're, you're on your way. If you died, I think you'd go to hell. I don't know for sure. I'm not the judge, but I wouldn't play with what you're doing. That's dangerous. And then some people, you know, they have to be brought to the truth because they have so much partial truth it's enough just to get them to confuse themselves. So going back to uh, 2 Chronicles with King Asa, so he repented and he gets rid of all the stuff. That, that's the foundation for us as you're going further. That's a continually cleansing process. And uh, we have to be going through it. We have to teach people to go through it. And then what happened is then he rebuilt the cities with fortified walls and protected it. That's one of the biggest faults I see with people who get in deliverance ministry and people who are going through deliverance. They don't fortify your, your, your walls, your protection. You gotta do it in your heart, protect your heart and mind. You gotta protect your family. You gotta protect your, fa your finances because this enemy will come in and it frustrates you. You know, the enemy has got in on my finances. Every time I can look back to me, it was some doubt, it was some unbelief, or it was some fear of what was coming upon the world. And since it was coming, in my assumption, I thought it could come to me. And so I made decisions out from a spirit that wasn't of God or of my flesh, which the enemy will work behind the flesh or behind, obviously, his deceiving spirits. So you got to rebuild it. You have to do it. And so you have to, that's renewing your mind. The enemy is going to assassinate who you are. He's going to assassinate your ministry. And everybody starts from the bottom. You know, and that's one of the things Mike taught me also. It's like, Mike, what's going on here? You want this dude to be a part of the team? Have you not heard his story? What did you see in that story that lit a fire on you to invest into this guy? I mean, he rebels against everything. He's relapsed the drugs 52 times. But it wasn't about what he saw. It was, hey, I saw God move on the person. It, whether it was in the heart, sometimes we see a heart shift. Uh, sometimes we see incredible deliverance shift where they're getting, you know, spirits out. I always kind of thought that first. Hey, if they're doing well in actual deliverance, then they're ready for deliverance ministry. But Mike was showing me something different that no, their heart shifted. You know, there, there was repentance. There was a, there was gratitude. There was thankfulness. There was a sense of awe of what God had done. Okay, we can build with this. And so then I had to hear that. And then Mike shared many testimonies of that. Now I know that to be true. And so everybody starts, they're starting from the bottom. And then when you're starting from the bottom, your gifts are going to sputter a little bit because you're <laughs> learning how to use your gifts coming out of your spirit, man, out of faith, out of trust in God's word, out of setting yourself apart. Then... As they're sputtering a little bit, they'll go and have some good testimonies, they'll see some good things, but then there's another level of purification. And so you repent, you rebuild, you, then you'll go into prosperity. Almost everybody, when you, when you fortify your life, your heart, your mind, you'll go into prosperity. God doesn't want you to be in debt, you know. Uh, lending money at usury, was not biblical. You know, we became the greatest debtor society in the history of the world. The greatest, most prosperous nation is the most in debt nation. So that knows you're in trouble when you go from the top to the bottom. Even though all these principles of faith are moving in America and innovation and hard work and diligence and all these things are still prospering in this country, we went into this big debt. So what you'll see is, is God will raise you up out of the debt when you have 
your walls built up. When you got the enemy out, he'll, he'll start helping your finances, especially when you're in debt. Some people come in, they're financially fine. I've, I've met numerous people like that. They know how to conduct their finances. They've always worked hard, so they've always prospered. But most people do come in in severe debt. And so then, like I said, you have to be cautious now because there's times and seasons. There's times where the money comes in like a flood so that he can raise you up out of financial debt and poverty. And now it might slow down a little bit. And if you're not spiritually discerning, you can say, oh, Lord, why did you cut the money off? Now I was out of debt. I was ready for, and you gave me the new car. I was ready for the new house. What happened to my finances? And so you always have to be growing in knowledge and wisdom and discernment. And so knowledge and wisdom will teach you that there's times and seasons, and then you can reflect on your experiences that, hey, what was I called to? I was called to help people, and I can't work 60 hours a week continually, because that's what I was doing when I first got into deliverance. I was in a bunch of debt. I got out of all the debt, and God gave me the energy to work 60 hours a week and minister 20 hours a week, and then pretty soon the, the, the money slowed down, well, it was time to regroup then and refresh and go to another level. So King Asa repented, he rebuilt, he prospered, and then he went through another test. And the test was, now you're outnumbered. And it was the, uh, it was an army that came against him with a million man army and he had 580,000. And so he went to God and he prayed. He said, whether we had more than them or they have more than us, Nothing is impossible for you, Lord. We're trusting in you. We're fighting in your name. And God gave him the victory. So then after they passed that test, he went to another level. He, he began to expand, getting rid of the idols and tearing down the incenses and, and all this evil stuff. So until you begin to do these things, you really can't go to that next level, right? You, you got to have seasons. You got to Deliverance is a process. A lot of people say it's like pulling back the layers. They came in layers, they come off in layers. Well, when they come out in the layers, it comes from repentance. It comes from then building a fortified city. You have to fight. You have to starve. You have to starve those spirits out of negativity. You got to starve them out. It's the way it is. There, there was the longest guy who ever fasted. He only ate sea salt minerals. He didn't, he didn't eat for 360 some days. He only drank water. He was a big fat guy, 400 pounds, and he came back to like a normal size. Well, he starved out all those fat cells. And I don't know if he, you know, what was after that fast, but he had enough fat is energy, right? It, that's why your body wants to store it. Because there was seed time and harvest, there was times of plenty, there was times of famine, and your body wanted to be able to tap into it. It wasn't like we had a corner circle K in a grocery store every square mile. And, you know, this, this abundance, that wasn't the way of humanity. So anyway, you got to be faithful with your resources, right? You can't just be stacking, stacking, stacking. You have to be faithful with them. The whole world is stacking them. Everybody I know that's not saved and, and every Christian that I know personally that is a good person because they've been saved, they love God, but they don't do anything for God. They're just stackers of their wealth. They're working for their 401k, they're working for their portfolio, they're working for their second home, they're working for their kids' college fund, all of the stuff. Nothing wrong with all those things, it's just that's all they work for. So there's no flow out of their finances. So sometimes the test is, is, is helping people in places and things. There's, there's people who, who need help. I, don't, I mean, God is going to lead you and guide you. Um, my, one of my first mentors, he had a, a clothing distribution ministry. And so he spent money on getting clothes for people. And that was back in the day. And now in America, we have 50 uh, clothing distribution centers. But back when he started in the 80s, there wasn't. And people wore tattered clothes and he would just clothing them. So God put it on his heart. That was something he never thought about. But he read in the scripture, I was naked. When did you come and clothe me? You know, I was in the hospital and sick. When did you come and pray for me? I was in prison. When did you come to visit me? Well, the Bible says those people who said, well, when did we see you naked? And when did we see you, you know, in the hospital sick? When did we see you in prison? He said, what you did to the least of these children of mine, you did it unto me. So God's going to call you. Now that might 
not cost any money. It doesn't cost me any money to go into the jails. We're not allowed to bring anything in. We can't bring anything out. So it's, 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 it doesn't cost anything, but it costs time, right? So that can be a step and back from your building and so that you can invest your time. So God's going to tell you how to do that. That's, that's what the Holy Spirit does. And he reveals your calling. He reveals your gifting. And he'll give you those people around you as a witness to be your support and encouragement. And to show you the way most of the time. So they go to another level. But what happened then is he failed. He started trusting in a man. Instead of going to war, he made an agreement with another king. He trusted in man, and the Lord sent the prophet before this as a warning saying, Hey, if you trust him and you're faithful to him, to the Lord, he will be faithful to you. But if you're not faithful to him, he will not be faithful to you. So the Lord will test you to see where your heart is and to see where your treasure is and to see what you really want. Some people love misery because that's all you've ever known. Some people start becoming deliverance junkies. Um, because it's, it's the only time they see the moving of the Spirit in their life. So they're not afraid to get sick with spirits. I mean, they've never told me this, but I can just tell you by the way they live. And so they're not afraid to relapse on drugs. They're not afraid to get the relationship with their wife busted up. They're not afraid to go back to porn because then it gets so bad. They'll, they'll even get sick. Like, I'm sick. My joints hurt. I got pain in my foot, my leg, my back, it's back again. Because the devil will bring pain upon you with sin. And once you know it's demons, he's now playing with some different stuff in his arsenal to bring upon you because you were putting something on him, he's going to put something on you. And, and that's just a warning. And it's, you know, I'm not saying it's the first time you mess up, you don't live in fear, you live in the fear of the Lord. We don't fear the one that can kill the body, but fear the one after killing the body can throw the soul in hell. So we have a fear of God, who is merciful, slow to anger, quick to forgive. But they get sick, and then they gotta have God. Brother Rick, I, I, I gotta see you, I gotta see you. I gotta see you right now, I, I need help, I need help right now. And then they go through this massive deliverance because they do have a good anointing on their life because they do have knowledge. They know 100% it's spirits, even though they weren't afraid of them to let them back in. They know it's them. And then when they're hurting, now they hate them. And then they'll get free and then they're fighting to get their things back. I gotta, I lost this job. I gotta get one. My wife doesn't trust me. I gotta get her to trust me. I, I, my, my daughters won't listen. My sons won't listen. I gotta get this back, whatever it is. And then they get back there and then they're kind of on that level. They don't fortify the city. They don't fortify the walls of which the enemy is coming against them with temptations. And then in return, they sin again, and then they're calling again. And, and the cycle, I've seen it. But what's so dangerous is some people at one point don't call. They don't call, and they get, they, they, I don't know where some of them are. They were around for a while. They were around for a few years. But I know that it's not good because they were playing around with sin. So... You can't trust in man. We have the warning. And then in return, towards the later part of his life, he gets sick. He's got a disease. And he doesn't even seek the Lord for the healing. He seeks only physicians and dies. So that's what we have to do as Christians. And that's what we have to teach people. you got to fortify the city. If, 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 if you're not, if someone's not praying every day, like how could you go about... There's no excuse. You can pray the Lord brushing your teeth. You know, you, you, you ladies, every lady I know, it takes a good minute to get yourself primped up and ready to go. You can talk to the Lord through that. It'd probably help you a little with not put so much of that stuff on as well. But you got time. There's no excuse. You're driving to work. No one's running to work. No one's moving a herd of cattle on your way to work. I mean, you can talk to the Lord driving, riding the bus. So there's no excuse. you got to put the Lord first. And then most people, you find when they're constantly recyclers, they only talk to God. They don't listen to God. And so you got to bring that to her attention, their attention. And uh, then they'll pop off a few scriptures. I said, is that what the Lord told you? you? He was telling you that. Before you went over here, you were praying this prayer. He told you that scripture. And then you went there. No, actually, I didn't hear the scripture there, but I know that's the scripture. And I said, okay, so there was a time where you were praying. 
you didn't hear and therefore you did what you used to do. So what was in the middle of that, trying to block that from happening, was God talking back. So you got to get a person to listen to the Lord. That, that's just basic fundamentals. I told you, all this stuff's going to come down to childlike understanding, is you have to have a person listen to the Lord. Most people don't understand listening to the Lord, and they get confused because when you, when you first get saved, I mean, God talked to me audibly a few times. I mean, I'm sure if you were right next to me, you wouldn't have heard it, but it was, I was hearing it. Not a question that was not, you know, confused whatsoever. And some of it longer than over others. Most of it was warnings not to do things. Not all of it, but most of it was. But then as a person matures, it says when the Holy Spirit comes, he comes to teach you and remind you of everything that was spoken. When the Holy Spirit comes, He writes the Word of God on your heart and mind. So that's how the Lord's speaking to you. So all these people, the devil just jumps in. He knows when you heard from God because you told it to five or six people. That's how Elon Musk and the government campaigns know exactly what to say because they have all the data. They have all the data, everything in Google, everything on social media, everything you thought, everything you complained about, it all goes into these computers, and now they know exactly what to say to make you, you know, believe their side. Well, the devil knows everything you said, and so he knows exactly what you think, and so you have to understand that, and he's, he's the accuser of the brethren, and so he's going to accuse you when you're speaking negatively. When you're speaking things and you don't believe, well, he's going to use that against you. And so that's why if you look at the best poker players, I don't play poker, but if you look at them, you know, that's why a lot of them wear sunglasses. They don't want to have a little twinkle in their eye. They don't want to have a little blink like, oh man, this is 50,000. You know, they don't want to show any signs of, of the position that they're in. And so you need to be, that's, you need to be, stand firm, the Bible says, in the day of evil. So there's hard things that come at us. That's just the way this world works. There's disappointments, there's betrayals, there's loss of good friendships, there's gossip that causes division amongst people that we love. There's all those things. It's, it's depicted in the Bible. But you can't just, you can't show the enemy. Like, it, you, you can't hide it. You're not supposed to bottle up your emotions. If you, there's a time of weeping. There's a time of laughter. There's a time of joy. There's a time of sorrow. Um, so you, I'm not saying that, but it's what you speak. When you start saying things, right, words is coming right from your heart, right? From the heart, the mouth speaks. And so that's where you got to you gotta just, you got to zip it. And so a lot of people... You'll find a real sick person. He needs, he needs answers from numerous people because he's looking for a, uh, an easy way. And, and you got to let them go. You know, they, they want to go to different deliverance ministers. They want to go back to a psychologist. You can warn them, but ultimately they want to hear what they want to hear. So if a person doesn't want to change and you go to a secular society, he tells you, hey, we're going to take some time. And over time, we're going to see this change. Well, okay, he'll go to that because now he's got time. He doesn't have to change today, right? And so that, that, that's tough, right? But I'm not going to speak negative to the person. I'm just going to look at it and say, okay, it says all things work together for those who love God. If they love God, God's going to work that out for good, showing them, hey, you lost a year two years following that man, following those instructions. And so, hey, not only did you suffer whatever it was you were suffering through, but now he took two years or a year, right? And so you got to trust in the Word of God because when you're helping people, they're going to make some of the worst decisions. And when you're helping three or four people, or, or like Mike Carter, 50 people, <laughs> you're going to have, you got to kind of balance the table. Right? So you got guys that are right on the brink of change. You need to be able to be there for them. Right? They've been doing well and they just need to work a few things out. You've seen it before and boom, they're off to the races. And then you got people that you're investing just coming up out of nowhere. Well, now if the persons that were already doing well come crashing down and you go sinking with them, then now this person that's ready to have his breakthrough, you don't have the faith to take them there. So you got to be able to, unfortunately, you got to be able to turn the page. And uh, that's where if you do your best, 
then you can have you could have some faith to move on. You're not abandoning the person. You're not discarding them like rubbish. You're saying, hey, they have free will. They can do what they want. And I have to respect it. If God respects it, I have to respect it. Hey, prayer changes things, so I don't have to stop praying for the person. Sometimes my prayer is the most powerful thing that the person can encounter. So, so then in return, when, when people do trust men, it, it is disheartening. Or they also don't trust themselves, and so they fail. But that's a part of the process. You can't trust in yourself. Jesus spoke only what the Lord told him to speak. He did only what the Father told him to do. Therefore, everything he did was perfect. And so as we move on, as God's shaping and molding us into the image of Jesus, we're going to do more of what he wants us to do and say, and less of what we think or what we want to do. That's just the natural process of being a disciple. Because most people don't understand that they were called to be disciples. The Great Commission was going to the world to make disciples of all nations, not Christians. Christians, they need a lot of church, and they need a, a lot of entertainment, and they're riddled with a lot of self. But Jesus says, unless you die unto yourself, you cannot be my disciples. And so that's the separation of a Christian and a disciple, as one was willing to lay down his life, his wants, his thoughts, his dreams, and then the Lord reveals and makes all things new. In Revelations 21.8, the first people thrown into hell are the fearful and the unbelieving. So if those are the first that are thrown in, well, those are going to be the most successful tactics of the enemy. You have to realize spirit is a fear. The Bible says fear is, is a spirit. So it says, I did not give you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So fear is a spirit. There's a natural fear. I don't play around on heights. I used to when I was a kid, inebriated. But I get up to place, I'm like, nope. I, I ski and I see some of those double diamond blacks and I'm like, no, the butterflies hit, like, no, let's ski all weekend, not just this last run. So that's a natural fear and that's good. We need a natural fear. Hey, I look down at my speedometer when I'm driving and I'm going 75 and a 65, I slow down like, man, I don't need my insurance going up $100 a month for the next two years or whatever it is. That's a natural fear. But a fear that doesn't stop, right? Hey, I'm speeding. Let's slow down. I stop that fear. Hey, I'm up on a four-story building. I'm too close to the edge. Let's step back. The fear stops. So a fear that's demonic doesn't stop. It just keeps pulsing. It just keeps going. And you can't make any moves to get rid of it. That's how you can discern that it's, it's, a, it's a demonic uh, level of fear. And, and it's, it's clear in 1 John chapter 4, 16 through 19, breaks down fear. It says, and we have believed the love of God has for us. God is love and he who abides in his love abides in God and God in him. So you have to realize God designed a human being to be loved and also that person to love God. So at one point, everyone has to wrestle with rejection, but they don't understand it's rejection, especially a person who's raised in a good family where their mother and father and siblings and friends all loved them. And that'll allow you to have a lot better root system and understanding of love. But over time, it won't be enough because there's not the loving of God because they're not born again. There's not the receiving of God's love. So no matter how much love they have in this world, it's not enough for them to overcome fear, fear of, you know, who they are and what they're doing is right because sin has to do with torment. And in going on, it says this, it says, the love has been perfected among us that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. So the boldness that we have to have that was depicted in uh, Proverbs 28, that the righteous are as bold as a lion. Well, it says the boldness comes from love. It doesn't come from, I've cast out so many demons in so many hours, and I've made so many disciples. No, your boldness comes from love. Verse 17, love has been perfect, perfected among us, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but it says perfect love cast out fear. 
So you can't just say, oh, fear, you come out of me in the name of Jesus. Well, hey, if you're on top of a building, you need to step back and the fear will subside. If you have a fear that comes from demonic spirits, the only thing that's going to get rid of that is the love of God coming into your life. And then you realize the victory has been won through Christ Jesus. And then on the day of judgment, I don't have to be fearful because he paid my price in full on the cross of Calvary. I don't add to my salvation. He says he paid for it with his blood. And his blood was shed for the remission of sins that he took my place. Now I can take the place of being righteous. His righteousness is imputed upon those who believe. And so finishing it up. There is no fear in love, but fear, uh, but love casts out fear because fear involves torment. So at one point you're going to be tormented. You don't have enough. The Instagram, it, I don't have it. Looked at it a few times, but it's a it's a complete manifestation of people who have fear. And so in order to overcome that fear, I got to be like Matt Gates and Botox my face <laughs> and, and be a bold witness for democracy. You know, hey bro, you're 40 whatever you are, dude. This is wrinkles is a part of, Clint Eastwood was a man amongst men. And uh, as far as what he showed in all uh, his movies, he had many wrinkles. That's not, anyway, that whole thing is filters. My buddy's, my, my uh, son's friend became a, multi-millionaire for the New England Patriots. He called my son and another guy and said, hey man, where are these girls? These girls around? And they're like, what do you mean? You play for the Patriots. What, what are you coming back to Chattanooga to, to date these women? He goes, oh bro, it's, it's, it's another world, man. I, I'm getting the Instagram models, but the problem is I show up to a five-star dinner on my dime and who shows up is not who's on those photos. And it wasn't just once. This happened to the guy numerous times. So he had to go back to somebody who actually he knew how they lived, knew what they actually looked like. That is a, some of them are that pretty, right? But then it's all mixed with sex. Well, a woman, and uh, not that I'm an expert at women, some say it's my greatest weakness, but I've learned a lot. And I know that women will love a man over time who loves them and they'll bypass the looks they'll bypass the money they'll buy, bypass the jokes and and, the, and all the fans and so-called friends they have for someone that loves them right and uh, sex when you, a woman's design is to only give that to someone who loves them well when you're showing something sexual you're giving them a part of your sex even if it's cleavage your rear end, which is just commonplace. I got a buddy, I was looking at his, he's a good Christian. And he shows pictures of his daughter's butt. And she's like a surfer and, and I'm like, bro, are you not seeing that's her butt? Like, I mean, he is just, in his mind, it's just his daughter, she's innocent. You know, he bathed her until she was two years old, changed her diaper. He's not seeing, man, that that's, that's what men want. I mean, men went to war for women. You know, men, men serve God to get a wife. He who finds a wife is a good thing. It was an investment to, to get a wife. And, and now it's like, well, I can just get bits and pieces from women who give me something sexual to temporarily sit, you know, satisfy my carnal desires. But anyway, going back to what Instagram is, it's all this me. You know, I'm, I'm a fitness model. I'm taking four steroids, but I'm all natty. Yeah, you're natty because they airbrushed the zits off your back shoulders. Uh, no. Uh, you put on 40 pounds in two years of solid muscle at 3%. No, it, it's, it's all a delusion. And that's why it causes such great depression for people. It causes great depression for the people. Now I've been watching it long enough on YouTube that the original person, people, it's went to another level. And at first, social media was just for the normal people, but now... All stars have to be on there, The Rock and everybody. They have to be on there to keep you know, up to speed with all the, the fans and, and what's going on to be relevant. And so in return, a lot of people were at top and now they're at the bottom.
It even happened to a lot of ministers. They just got weeded out. And uh, it's, it's a delusion. And so giving a part of your sexuality to anybody is a delusion. You know, a Christian must bring their sexuality down and he must control their body in sanctification and honor. If they won't do it, then they're, they're going to be prone if they've had to be appreciated by men. I mean, I would hate to be a good-looking woman. I, I've found myself watching some. I'm a covert, you know, out of the corner of my eye. I don't want to be that guy. But I see guys just stopping. It just And, and, and uh, a matter of fact, a Christian guy told me one time, he said he was kicked out of a gym. And he goes, he's like 60 or 55 at that time. And he goes, yeah. I wasn't aware of stranger danger and all that, so I was talking to this girl, the gym was closed, and I said, hey, would you do something gentlemanly, uh, being a gentleman, would you like me to walk you to the car? And she called the gym and said, this guy creeped me out, and I'm kicked out and lost my membership. And, uh, but he wasn't perverted like that, he just didn't have any instincts. This girl was so used to so many perverts being perverted that she just assumed he was a pervert that caused fear in her. So a Christian has to get away from sexual identity. I mean, hey, if you, if, if you want to get a man, the Bible says, hey, let, let the beauty of a woman not be mere outwardly with the braiding of hair, the wor uh, wor worldly clothing, the fine clothing and the, and the gold, but let it be of, a, you know, of the heart. And so a man of God will be looking for that. And so you don't have to, yeah, it's fine to keep yourself in shape. That's important. If your body's not in shape, you're going to be tired, especially as you get older. You're going to, when you, I, I'm, I know I now I got to lose some weight because, man, I can't do what I used to do. There's times where I don't work on a regular basis, but I got to crank out an eight or nine hour day, partially in the sun. And man, I come back, my body just says, go to bed. It could be 8.30. So it's important to take care of your body. You want to be single, that's good to take care of your body. But it's when your body is everything, where your sexuality is your value. Then you're going to be misled. You're going to find continually the wrong partners because you're going to be looking for the same thing in which you feel you have to have to get someone. You're going to be looking for that in them. And so you got to come out of that whole, that whole system. And, and, and it's hard for people. You know, men will say, well, man, I've been masturbating since I was a teenager. You're telling me I can't even do that? I'm like, no, you can't. That it says all sex out of wedlock is, is, is not permissible. That's sex with yourself. You can't have sexual stimulation without sexual contact. And they're like, oh, are you sure is that in the Bible? And I said, the theme of God is in the Bible. Does it say that exactly? No, but I mean, what are you going to think about? And if the devil shoots fiery darts, you could say, well, I'm going to think about whatever. And you can make a story up to yourself, but he's going to fire darts at your mind. He might not do it the first or second or third time, but as you give place, then he's going to have schemes at the level of which you give him place. And it's hard to do. It has to be done through the Holy Spirit power. And so I feel that when you go to those social media sites, especially Instagram, TikToks and stuff like that, well, not, not necessarily, I don't really look at TikTok, but Instagram especially. It's, it's about your value system according to the world perceiving your value. Whether your value is your beauty, you know, your work ethic, your physique, you got to come out of that. And you can't compare yourself with that. It's going to be a delusion to keep you wrapped up at some level. So that's for yourself and that's for people. And then once you get delivered, then you can kind of see it. And as I talked about it, you know, uh, Thursday, I think, you know, there's like a hedge of, it is, it's a hedge of protection, the Bible says, he'll put around you. So Peter's was so strong that if you came within the vicinity of him, you'd actually get healed. And Paul, he could just touch stuff that send garments and pieces of clothing and the people would touch it, they'd get healed because their protection from the wicked one was so strong and the anointing of God was so strong in their life. Now, did that make him exempt from being whipped with, with stripes? No. Beaten with rods? No. Stone? No. Imprisoned falsely? No. Betrayed? No. Chipwreck? No. Even though he had that protection around him, you still go through the trials of this world. So that's something a lot of people don't understand. 
I was doing so well. I've done better than I've ever done. Why isn't the Lord blessing me? Why isn't, why isn't these relationships coming back? Why isn't my job giving me that promotion, which I always wanted? And I don't understand why I didn't get it before because I wasn't faithful and I was grumbling. But now I'm not grumbling and I'm faithful. Where's that promotion? Well, there's times of testing. There's times where you got to walk out your salvation with fear and trembling, where you're learning to get an awesome reverence for God. Most Christians, not saying you, but most Christians do not have an awesome reverence for God. They, and I kind of thought of it this way too. Lord, you're so big and so powerful. I mean, I can't even imagine speaking something into existence that you create all this and sustain it all with your power. So my little sin, one of 300 and... 50 billion people or whatever it is on earth, how many there is, and me sitting, is that really a big deal? I know I shouldn't do it and it's going to hurt me, but it doesn't really hurt you. You're too big. But the Bible says sin hurts God. And so if you don't see that sin hurts God, then that blocks you from that reverence, awe, and respect of God. So you, that's another fundamental that you got to bring down to the basics for, for someone that you're helping. Um, this is, uh, this is going to be in my book. God showed me this. So Satan's in charge of all this principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness. Spiritual host of, of wickedness in the heavenly realms. The demons are the worker bees. I'm not saying the earth is not flat. <laughs> this is how United Nations depicts it. So here you are, this is no one's physique in particular, they're going to wage this war against you. Satan is the chief operating officer, the principalities and the powers in my opinion are the fallen angels, the rulers of darkness of this age is the training center where they train the demons, the spiritual host of wickedness is the operation system. The demons now are the enforcers and they come upon people. This is very powerful. Then this is the goal. This is hell right here. So the first thing they do is they work with lies. They're going to try to get in your mind. That's the first thing you got to do is shut the door on the enemy. What's the door? Yeah, uh, Cain said if you do well... You'll be accepted. If you don't do well, sin is at the door. Its desire is to have you. You must rule over it. It's the doorway into your mind. Hey, Cain, kill your brother and you don't have to change. That's a delusion. He got, how do you get someone that... I mean, there's minimal sin in the world at that point, right? There's, there's not the stuff that we got going on around here, but the sin nature is the same. But they're actually even able to still hear from God. And uh, he gives him the warning. Hey, this is what's happening to you. And uh, a lot of people, they blame a lot of stuff. Demons, 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 right? You got to look at yourself. Demons are going to go into operation to the place that you give them. Now, yes, they can come down and be in, oper in operation because of the sins of your fathers through victimization, primarily at your own door. But God gives you the mind of Christ and spiritual discernment. So you got to shut the door to the enemy is to the lies coming in on your mind. The Bible declares them as the wiles of the devil, the tricks, the schemes. Then what happens is now this thing goes into operation. And as you don't stop the lies, it becomes a hold. So, so Cain didn't stop the lie. And the hold of wanting to kill his brother actually went into operation. He bashed his head in with a rock. I mean, that's some hardcore sinning. And then as they get a hold, the further they'll go, it'll become stronger and stronger. A stronghold. Man, they'll steer you around. They'll take you to places. 
You know, they'll, they'll take you to places. It, it calls people's names. They'll, a lot of people say like, hey, I was doing good, but I couldn't get rid of this thought. Man, I just need to look at some bikinis, man. I need bikinis. I was like, I shouldn't look at bikinis. I'm, I'm, I'm 30 years old and married with two kids. I couldn't get it out of my mind until boom, it was bikinis and then it was full porn. Bam, how'd I get here? The lies were already in the door that you could look at whatever you wanted to look at. The Bible says, be careful what you look at, be careful what you listen to, be careful what you speak. The lie has to come into the mind before you see it, before you speak it, before you listen to it. Hey, it's okay to do this, it's okay to overlook this sin. So then the hold, it gets stronger. Now the person's oppressed. So once you get the oppression of the devil, man, you want things, but you can't get things because he's oppressing you. Most people are, are, are stuck right here. This is, this is about the majority of your, if I'm making up numbers. Most of these people are under a hold or oppression. But then you start going down to the hardest levels and now these people are depressed. A depressed person doesn't even care that he's oppressed anymore. It's all about him. I feel bad. It's negative. God doesn't care. Nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. Look at me, man. I'm fat now. Look at my face. I, I, two years ago, I didn't have these wrinkles. I'm aging so rapidly. I mean, it goes on and on and on. If you don't stop them there, these are the people that go into depression. I mean, my so deception. I'm sorry. You go into deception. Once you're deceived, nobody can help you because you can't tell the truth from a lie. Now, God can help you. He can, he can break you in prison. He can break you in the insane asylum. He can break you anywhere, anytime, but we can't help you, right? You want to believe a lie? You, you, you want to believe it's demons, demons, demons. You've been to 50 different deliverance ministers. All you do is watch stuff on demons. And, and you, you're trying to tell the person, hey, it, it, it's, it's not a matter of the demons. It's a matter of your heart. And, and it says wherever your heart is, there's where your treasure is. You got, you got demons in your heart so much that that's all you do is think about demons. And you want to just get rid of demons, but you don't want to change your heart. Oh, man, I need Mike Smith. This guy's going to do his, his go-to move to get out of when he don't have my answers as a rookie. I mean, they just believe all these, these lies, right? And ultimately, once you go through this, you're, you're oppressed. You want the blessings, can't get them. You're depressed. You no longer want the blessings. You're deceived. You don't even care. Last drop off is hell, and that's for eternity. And that's sad. The Holy Spirit showed me things when I go to funerals. I know when the people went to heaven or not. The Holy Spirit shows me. And I either get cries because the person's in hell, or I cry because the Holy Spirit was there saying, hey, I took them home. People go to hell and it's real. Most people in humanity go to hell because the only way to the Father is through the Son, Jesus Christ. Many of those people who don't have the Son, they had the Son. But they departed from the faith. They became shipwrecked. They got entangled and they got ensnared. And they were led astray by the devil. And uh, they became the fearful and the unbelieving. And they're the first ones thrown into hell. It's real. So we're trying to save people. When you, when you get in deliverance ministry, you're trying to save them. The only thing that saves them is the blood of Jesus Christ. Then once they're saved, you're trying to help them uh, to be free and to cut off the sin that so easily entangles that they would run the race to win the prize, that they would fight the good fight of faith. That's the, that's the fight. S -H -O -W oh, don't, don't correct my spelling now. I abbreviated it because I can't spell. Which one? Oh, this is the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly realms. That's Ephesians chapter 6. I can open it up some, for some questions. Anything you got. Uh, that's, that's the framework, the basics of it. And remember, when you're doing deliverance, 
you got to stay always at the basics. I don't think there's any problem in knowing the names of these spirits. Could there be something if you were clear that it was that spirit and tacking him head on? Um, that, that would make sense. But what I understand is the strongholds have supporting cast. And all their supporting cast is fear, doubt, unbelief, unworthiness, ungratefulness, unthankfulness, unholiness. And then all those spirits have manifestations. So through exposing the manifestations, then we can get to the motivation of the person. They can repent and you can be free from everything. So if you start getting into this thing where you need a certain man of God, you need to do certain hours of deliverance. We don't know how long it's going to take. Some people have came here and I said, wow, I thought they were doing good. How come they didn't come here and disciple with, with, with the ministry team? Well, uh, they come back later and they became disciples. They were discipled by the Holy Spirit. God does what he wants with whom he wants to do it with. And they were bearing good fruit. So it proved that then when they came one or two times, they did get delivered. So you can't, you can't say, oh, this is going to take a long time. May it take a long time? Yeah, and I believe deliverance is all your life. It was through the whole theme of the Old Testament that there was just levels upon levels. Even as King Asa had went to different levels, there was always a test to raise you up to another level. And when the other test came, he made a peace treaty with the man. In return, he failed the test and he suffered the consequences. And then he died sick rather than dying with faith to be healed because God would have healed him. I'll open it up to any questions you got about anything pertaining to deliverance or helping people. Once someone asks, then everybody's got a question. So you just got to be the first one. So I have a fellow who came here a couple weeks ago for deliverance and now he's in the hospital. And he's pounding his phone, calling my husband and I, just like, do you have a word for me? And uh, just... Mm -hmm. Just his wife has left him, his family is, is it's over. And David Baldwin is his friend, and I'm working with him. He says, David deserted me. And I said, David didn't desert you. He says, he, he, like, we're trying to be an encouragement to him, but he's got to, like, we're picking him up tomorrow at the hospital, driving him to his daughter's, but he's got to just have the faith and, like, we well, always come back to the basics that the Bible says, if you love your family, your daughters, your son, your mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. So that means everything can be tested right now. And everything doesn't have to be tested. You know, you want to test your marriage. God goes and starts treating his wife bad or sexually immoral. Right. So you don't have to have it tested, but it shows that anything is on the table of being tested. So it comes down Hey, Job was stripped down to nothing. A matter of fact, his wife when left, she was left. Oh, it was to the point because Satan said, hey, she'll tell you to even curse God and die. She'll be the last one to try to be the encouragement for me, right? So he lost everything. I mean, he's in way worse shape than your friend that's coming back from the hospital. I mean, he had the boils, everybody turned on him. His buddies came to him and said, hey, what sin does, you know, this doesn't happen to righteous people. What, what have you been doing? And so no one believed him. He lost everything. In return, he wasn't happy about nothing, but he trusted God. And he wouldn't do what the, the accuser said he would do. He will curse you to your face. And uh, he did not do it. And in return, God rose him back up. So I don't know all the details, but what that person has to realize is there were all these tentacles from this system that were on him. There was holds, there was places, there was lies, there were wiles into operation. And then the fruits of that, so you want to go through some deliverance, it's like a, a fighter. Mike Tyson got knocked out by Buster Douglas. At that point, he was the greatest fighter ever walked the planet Earth. But what he was doing, he says in a documentary, man, I was sleeping with the eight hookers the night before and they were feeding me grapes like I was Julius Caesar. I didn't even train because he believed the hype that he was going to knock him out. It was like a 50 to one favorite. 
And in return, that guy came to fight. And so there was the infrastructure to dismantle the most powerful man in a boxing ring to get defeated by a journeyman fighter. I don't think he won another fight after he beat Mike Tyson. I know the first fight he fought with the belt, he lost. So now we have been given power over the devil, but the problem is he emasculates that power. He strips us from the power with, with this process. So what you got to do is just go back to the basic that if God isn't everything, then you have to question why he's not. Of course you want your wife. Of course you want your mind back. Of course you want your family. Of course you want a ministry and a hope. And of course Dave Baldwin has it and you don't have it. But okay, what was Dave telling you? How do you get from where you are, where he was too, to this place? And so, hey, there's times where Dave Baldwin is, he's, he's got a lot of insight with the Holy Ghost that I haven't developed. Because he came out of an area in the mind that I hadn't been through. So he's actually helping that man, I guarantee you. So if he pulled back, it was because at that point, I'm, I'm interpreting, was he knew that man has to get something not from a man, but from God. Because as he broke through, yeah, he had Mike Smith, great mentor. Yeah, he had you know, all these other Christian ministers that spoke into his life. But at one point, what was going to take David Baldwin to the freedom, Dave knew was the Holy Spirit. And so he's, he's, he's going back to the basics. And so that's what you're going to work off. Because, yeah, you feel bad for people, but why should that inhibit Chipotle when you go and buy him some tacos tomorrow? Oh, you, come on, Dave, or Bill, or Bob. Come on, oh, you lost your wife, you're out of the psych med. You're out of there. Like, hey, this is a day. You're out of there. If you put this together, the Word of God, the promises of God, you can get, hey, maybe you don't get that wife back. I don't know, but you'll get everything you need. You'll get everything you need. God supplies all your needs according to His glorious riches which are in heaven. So you got to always work the foundations. I can't come over here with sweet nothings. I can't come over here with a bunch of uber humanly love. Oh, you've been unloved. Let me hug you, cry on your shoulder. Not that that's not uh, proper to do. But that can't be all I'm giving them because then I won't be there, right? I won't be there. They got to be by themselves. And uh, yeah, the, there's things tough, but God will do it, you know. And David Baldwin, he, he's got some powerful stories. They're so powerful. I told him when we first got in the jail ministry 10 years ago, I said, Dave, you can't tell those in here. I said, these guys ain't ready for those, Dave. We got to tell them these down here. All these up here, maybe, but not out of the gate. Because they're looking at Dave like, is this dude out of his mind? Is he lying to us? But no, he, 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 that guy's been getting blessed. Knowing you, knowing Dave, being a, along with this ministry, how many times he was here. Let's keep working with what God did. Because that's why you came into his life. That's why Dave came into his life. That's why we were able to speak whatever we were able to speak into his life. So we got to keep working with what God's doing. Because there's no way he would get all that if God wasn't doing something. That's good. Ne all right. Next question. We'll just go another. Okay. Hey, if somebody's uh, coming out of like Satanism or something, they, and they did specific rituals, for specific demons by name to let them in. Are you calling them all by those names? Oh. Is that a specific deal? Oh, that, that's a good one. If you didn't hear that online, uh, Mike Carter said, hey, if you're taking someone out of the occult, Satanism, New Age, do they have to call those demons out in whom they summoned into their life for certain things in their life? Absolutely. Absolutely. When you know you called on something, that's why some people get freaked out when they come to the center and there's women screaming and flopping around like a fish and going, do I got to go through that? Two little kids were here two weeks ago. It was like, hey, are you coming over here to make me throw up in that bucket? <laughs> and I said, uh, no. I said, you guys are just little guys. You, you, these, these people, they were adults and they invited those demons. And I said, something jumped on you and they had been to a relative's house and got freaked out with horror movies. And they were like seven and five. 
So a seven and a five year old doesn't have to know the name of the particular demon that attacked them through fear. But a Satanist? Oh, absolutely. You know, because remember, it, I never been involved in that, never thought about being involved in that. I always knew I had enough troubles in my life. I wasn't looking to add more troubles. And, uh, but absolutely, because those spirits will give you stuff. I know a guy who used to go down and uh, he would go down and he would meet women at bars on a weekly basis. And he would talk to them, but if he wouldn't see a sparkle, a literal sparkle in their eye, he knew to cut off the conversations and move on to another one that he would not be able to have intimacy that night with them. So move on. But once he saw the sparkle, he knew, make your investment because tonight it's happening. And it always did. So those new age spirits, he didn't even correlate it with getting into the new age, which he was trying to do self-improvement and self-enlightenment and discovering all the powers within humanity. And in return, they were giving him the world and he didn't even correlate it with his nightlife. So of course you gotta, you gotta renounce those devils because they're literally coming to give you the world in the forfeiture of your soul. So they gave you some stuff, but also they took some stuff. So absolutely, you, you know their name. You call those things out. And you gotta let, you got to make them call it out. Like some people, I tend to, and one of the things I need to get better on, I kind of pray the prayer for them. So I kind of size the person up and say, hey, no sense having them give this little half-hearted prayer. I'll pray for you, you know. But you can't do that for someone that's been in the occult and new age. No, nope, they've been using their lips and they've been using their chants and their charms. And now they have to speak back themselves. So don't even try praying for them. You can pray to that point where say, okay, now you pray the Lord. You apologize. Now you renounce that devil. It's got to come out of their lips. Go ahead. When do we cast out demons out of people? I think um, you can cast out demons out of people right away. I mean, you got to gauge yourself, right? I would say this. I wouldn't be going and looking to cast demons out of anyone until I had faith to go looking for someone. If I felt, oh, I should be doing this. God expects me to be doing this. Then I would continue to work on myself, right? But obviously everyone that's been a part of this ministry, including the Mike's own testimonies, you, you can listen online. We've all got more deliverance as we started helping other people because we thought we were delivered because <laughs> compared to before, we certainly were delivered from stuff. We didn't know that there was layers to it, right? And, uh, and I can only imagine by thinking of the thoughts I think and the life I live, there's some more to go for me too because I'm not perfect. And uh, until you're perfect... There's going to be a level of deception in your life. There's going to be a level of compromise. There's going to be a level of rebellion, self-sufficiency, you name it. So I'll deal with it. I can feel them, though. I, I, I can sense them when they're ready to go. I can sense them. One of the first things you can either feel them moving in your body, that's early in the process. You'll feel like, like kind of like heart flutter a little bit, butterflies, sometimes a sick feeling in your stomach. You can feel them. You're getting close to God and God's just saying, here's time. I'm tired of these things. You ready to go? Use what I gave you, right? But as you go on further, you, you start getting a hatred for them. Because yeah. God says, hate what I hate. Love what I love. And you're like, man, I hate this. This thing's been hammering me. I, I've been wrestling with this for a while. I, I, don't, I hate this. Not like I'm tired of this. Uh, I'm frustrated with this. It's like, Boom, I hate this. And, and that, that comes as you get close to the Lord because he does hate the devil. I mean, it's hard to believe. I've met people, man, I, someone was telling me about it. I don't know if I watched it online or someone was telling, telling me about it. But they thought they were going to have a ministry and, and they were going to help these demons get saved. <laughs> And I, I mean, these people weren't out of the loony bin. These people were like church going people and a thought came into their mind and it seemed reasonable in their flesh. Like, well, God wants all to be saved. No, all humans to be saved. 
not all beings. He wrote, these are all going to hell. This is what hell was created for. Hell was not made for humans. This system is trying to take humans where they're going. And so, yeah, that was the opposite of, of spiritual growth. Well, as you grow, you're supposed to hate the demons more, not look to rescue them. Any more questions? Okay, go ahead and we'll get right to you. No, go for it. Oh. How do you even accept, like, even just accepting the thought that, that knowing that they might go to hell, like, most likely going to go to hell if they pass? Well, how do you even handle that? Well, that's, that's some good, a uh, bunch of good questions. How do you help these people, especially the people that are closer to the end, close to going to hell, and how do you deal with it emotionally? Well, I believe that all people, so all people, some people are free, some people are believing lies, some people have a hold, some people are oppressed, some people are depressed, and some are deceived. God wants them all to be saved, so I'm working with the winning combination, right? Uh, now, God touches people everywhere. Well, all the lost, there's levels of deception, right? So all the lost are, are deceived, Right? They're completely deceived. They, they're lost. They believe that we came from monkeys that used to be boogers that swam. Uh, I mean, they, 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 they're out there. They, they became foolish. A fool in their heart says there is no God. Right? But now there's the Christian deceived. Now, th these people, these people are in great danger. God don't love me anymore. If God cared for me, then I'd, he'd take this crack from me. I'm like, bro, he didn't give you the crack. You just lied, cheat, stole, robbed, and you went and bought the crack. He didn't give you the crack. So that person, he wants to believe the lie. Does God save these people? All the time in prison. All the time in prison, all the times, you know, at a breaking point of themselves, right? So these people... You know, you want to do your best, but it says you don't throw pearls to swine, at least they trample them underfoot, right? So these people, you obviously love all people, right? And when anyone has an ear to hear anything good, you, you, you want to tell them as much as they can understand. But you can't call a deceived person three times a week trying to fix them, right? You can speak love to them, right? But then when you speak love, then love also has a choice at the end of it, which is repentance, believing. Uh, for the, I'm talking about the Christian. The lost, we just got to preach to them. That's why you go into the world and you preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And now they got a chance to go through this thing fast because when you first get someone saved, getting them delivered and help goes really fast because they don't have all the webs to, to, to untangle. So, yeah, the depressed person, I have them call me all the time. And what they used to do in my life was they would tell me all their problems. So I let them speak a little and tell me their problems, but I don't let them go on and on. I go through my Bible memorization. I don't study six by nine cards. I use my Bible me me uh, study and memorization to speak to people who are depressed who call me. And I just start repeating scriptures. And then I know God's there because they'll start going in alignment to the person. So I'm trying to speak life to the person, hoping that they'll snap out of believing these lies. So I always got to love them because if I don't love them, they won't allow you to speak. If you're trying to fix them, they're not going to listen to you. Because they try to fix themselves. They don't believe it works. So you have to love them and you have to speak the truth. But you have to believe you're working with the winning combination. You have the Holy Spirit and you have love. So I'm believing for all these people to be saved. Once they're dead, now I don't spend one more prayer for them because it's over. Right? 
I might cry, I might be sad, but then I just move on. And then um, through that process, are you praying for them prior to even speaking with them? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Demons prior to, you know. Pray, prayer changes things. We're trying to get someone's heart touched. If their heart's not touched, we can't get them delivered from spirits, right? So, yeah, prayer changes the world. That's where a lot of people get confused. They're binding demons in the heavenlies. And then you get sick. You want to, it doesn't even make sense. If you couldn't beat someone up in sparring, you got no business getting in a ring thinking you're going to fight a real opponent because a, a sparring partner is not giving you the works. He's not giving you everything. So then if you could win a local amateur match, you got no business fighting somebody in the pros, right? And so you, you, you got to change the world by prayer. You can't be binding demons of porn. It don't work. All these demons who do it, all these ministers that do it, it, it doesn't work. If it seemed to work for them, it's because they kind of came out of nowhere. And then they learned this thing from the Holy Spirit, but they didn't know it all. And then in return, when they died, the rest of their followers can't really succeed. Those ministers just went, Oom, and all they do is distribute that minister's stuff, even though they've been dead 20 years. Because you don't have authority in the heavenly realms. You have authority over your own demons. You have authority over the demons that are coming against you. You have a demon. You got authority over the demons over your family. You have the authority over the demons of anybody who wants help. But you ain't got the authority. And ain't, no one can tell you this. There's not one ministry. If it works and they can bind in the heavenlies, you say all the data of pornography is, is recorded. They'll show you how many hits went to all these different triple X sites. Triple X extreme, whatever they all are, right? And uh, you say, okay, all 50 of you went to war against porn. Where's the decrease in the numbers of views? And they're not going to show you anything. Because even if they did, the Bible says in the last days, people will gather around themselves, teachers that will teach what their itching ears want to hear. This happens to the Christians that don't want to be warned of the wrath to come. They don't want to be taught that it's a spiritual warfare. They don't want to believe that you can walk away from your salvation. They don't want to believe these things. So they promote what they want, these teachers. Well, what about a sinner? The porn sites didn't come about to implement porn upon people. No, it came upon as a request of the people. I want easy access. I want this stuff at my fingertips on my smartphone. And so they have the right. They would just reconjure up these demons instantly because it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of their will. There's not going to be a day where Christians bound every porn demon is like, dude, what should I do? There's no porn to watch. I should probably go help people. <laughs> I should further my education and get a degree. You know, it's not going to happen because we don't have authority over those. That's why Jesus didn't do it. The disciples didn't do it. The Word of God doesn't teach it. And they'll take one verse. The kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Yeah, that's true. It's a war. So in a war, there is violence. There is violence imposed upon you and upon your family. And the church does need to stand in agreement as the attack is against the church of God, right? You drive him out of your house. You drive him out of your church. You know, that's why it says if someone's sexually immoral, you get him out of the church. I had a buddy, man, and, and I was like, man, that girl... Man, her son's a little too huggy with, with the mom, man. What's up with that? The girl was real pretty. And it was this little boy was like a creepy 14-year-old boy all over the mom. And he goes, no, bro, those are lesbians. I'm like, what? That's a little girl? And, uh, and they just came to the church. And he just thought that he was a hardcore preacher. There were no problems with his preaching. It was off the hook. And then when he was teaching repentance, but he didn't come to them face to face. So the Bible says, hey, if someone's sexually immoral, you got to get him out of the church. Someone's into witchcraft coming to church. Paul was turning people over to Satan. Like, hey, I'm not even going to pray for you. There's got to be a destruction of your flesh, and he's going to come and destroy it. Something I can't do, so I'm going to let him do it. And then, hey, when they repent, let them back into the church and restore them to their rightful position in the church. Don't teach them, treat them as second-class citizens. But there are certain things that only, you know, you got to get them out, right? You're not supposed to eat with these people, I'm telling you. Some, it happens 
Um, like I've, I've heard, like they smoke weed on job sites. It's, it's, it's legal now, so they smoke it like cigarettes on their breaks. And it's not my place, and I'm not, I'm just, a, I work for the company. It's not my company, so I can't tell them what to do. And I found that out because I was trying to kick a guy off the job site. Like, why don't you just go home? He goes, it's not your job site, you know. So I can't tell them what to do. And, uh, but sometimes when they're talking this godless chatter about women, man, I'll go home, and what's the thoughts the enemy sends is when I lived that life. When, when, I, when I had access to those things with no regard, where there was no conscience, there was no filter, so it was in my life. And the, he'll just play that like a movie, to, hoping that I'll reach out for it and, and, and bring it into the hedge of protection which God has. So those thoughts, so I, I, I got to get away from it, right? Thoughts are powerful. Thoughts come through words and from stories. And so if this is in the church, there's a spiritual force behind that. So even though the person's not talking that, they're not speaking it, they're living it. And therefore those spirits are moving around the church. And if they're not dealt with, spirits feast on sin, they get stronger through sin, therefore they'll multiply right in your congregation. And so they had to be dealt with. And eventually they did leave the church. Um, but I, you know, I was young at Holy Ghost Ministry at that time, understanding stuff, but I know now that has to be confronted and dealt with. If it's not dealt with and confronted, then the people think, well, I just got as much time as I want to deal with something. No, you're bringing something spiritual into the house of God. Now, I'll still help you in counseling and ministering and prayer, those type of things. But at one point, you got to, that's according to the New Testament teaching, you got to cut yourself and get away from them, don't even eat with them. And then you got friends, the Bible says if you preach the gospel to someone and they reject it, you're not supposed to let them in your house. Yeah. And it says, be careful of a wicked man, and you're going to bring correction. Consider yourself, lest you find his ways. He's under spiritual oppression. I, I've, I've found people that went over to help people or let them move into their house, and then soon were doing things just like them. I was helping this guy, and he took off like a rocket casting out demons, he was preaching the gospel, he had a great boldness, great success, and then the devil sends a plant. He always has to send somebody. Well, he wasn't looking for new roommates on Craigslist. A friend from college came. And man, this guy, I was like, bro, he, he's like, you're religious? I'm religious. He had some big cross from his family with Jesus on it. And I'm like, bro, you got the name on the leash. You're going to put that idol up here in your house? I said, that's another Jesus, but I didn't Confront it hard enough for him to get away with it. Pretty soon that guy's yearning to go out and see the city. They're living in Tempe and to go out and party. Well, soon enough he's doing it. Pretty soon he was knocked out bad. And he's still suffering the consequences. Been to prison three times. Before the deliverance, he had never been to prison. So you got to warn people. Now, I can't badger you. I don't have to harp on you, but I need to give you a stiff warning because sin is very powerful. You had a question? You kind of answered it. So we, we know somebody. She's definitely oppressed, depressed, deceived. She's a Christian woman. But the way she speaks, I believe she, she's in agreement with the lies of the enemy. She's not believing the word of God. How do you help somebody like that? And, and every time I have cousins, I always, so I'm very um, sensitive to spirits. So... That, her depression just like brings me down. Well, that's so she, showing you two things right there. Go ahead. She's afraid, she's been here once, but she's afraid to come back because she's afraid demons are going to jump on her. Well, um, demons have to come in through a door, right? And uh, my, my buddy kind of told on himself one day. He said, man, I got out of there. I said, dude, why'd you leave? Oh, he was there on my first deliverance. I didn't know if I needed deliverance, but I said, he does. So if this is real, we're going to find out. Well, as we were going about the third deliverance, he took off and ran out during the prayer time. And I said, why'd you leave? And he goes, and he's a real smart guy, way smarter than me. And uh, got a bunch of degrees, successful, street smart. He's got it all. And I didn't pick it up at first. He said, man, I got out of there because they were casting out that homosexual spirit of that dude in front of me. I wouldn't want no part of that. 
I realized he was watching on the internet and he knew he was smart. He knew, hey, there's a door open here. I don't need something that'll actually get me having a man lover. So they have to have open doors. Going back to your question, two parts to that. How do you help someone that's de deceived and depressed? And when you go over there to help them, pretty soon you start feeling depressed and a little bit deceived. Well, okay, that shows you, you gotta stay with the basics. Now, if the person refuses to believe the truth, then, you know, at one point you gotta let them go because you gotta, you gotta go over the basics. Okay, in God, God is the truth and in him is no lie. God is not a respecter of persons. You got to go over to, with the people. If he did it for one person, he'll do it for everybody. So you're in the everybody category. He wants to help us. Okay, if you get him, if, if they don't, can't receive that part, why should I tell them anything more? Well, what do you mean? How are you excluded? Show me why you're excluded. Well, I've done this and I've done that. Well, Paul said he was the chief of sinners. So the best you could be is an Indian sinner. He's the chief. He killed Christians, separated Christians, made them deny Christ. But he was what he was, he says, by the grace of God. And so whatever you're going to be is going to be through the grace of God, what you don't deserve. But the minute you exclude yourself from being in the camp of all humanity, why should we go any further? Because now I'm treading on ground in which they don't want to go to that level. So now I'm subjecting myself to these spirits coming on me because they already said, I got authority here. How are you going to kick me out when they said already, and you know it, they want to believe a lie. They won't even believe the basics of the scripture, the basics of the gospel. So at that point, you do what you can do, and then you got to go, and you stay to the basics. Either you're in the camp of God or you're not, right? And... Uh, and then the person has to have some prayers to leave them with. Like, okay, when you pray, stop praying, Lord, fix me. Be more intentional. Change my heart, O Lord. Show me what's offensive to you, Lord. This is, the, this is the fuel system. This is the root system we need to change here. Not driving out the demons in my body and then my heart gets good. It starts with my heart getting right. And then in return, I'll get the spirits out of my body and out of my head. Let's start to the basics. Then as they, okay, yeah, I am in the Bible. Okay, God does love me. Well, he saved me. Didn't he make a covenant? Yeah, he made a covenant that he would never leave me and never forsake me. He made a covenant that he would finish the good work in which he began in me. Okay, now we're step two. Now going, okay, don't you believe that this is spiritual now? Now this thing's running on its own. They made you, act. they'll bring something to you. And when it's sin, of course, things that you want are easier for the demons to impose their will upon. Right? Flesh cries out to be served. So if it's lustful, a lust spirit comes in. Well, hey, I wanted lust and I got more lust and I got more success with lust in the sin nature. So of course I gave it place. But when a demon imposes his will, that one was wanted. But here, hey, I just had doubt. I just had unbelief. Then the fear led to torment. The torment led to oppression, to deception. Now I'm held down. And so they're imposing the will of these demons are imposing it upon the person. That's where you need to be free because they're going to run and operate in the way they do. The woman with the hunched back couldn't raise herself up. She's bent over like this. She can barely look around to see what's going on. And it says it took 35 years for the spirit to do that. First, it was a kink in the neck. And then and I had one one time. I went to a chair massage at Arizona Mills Mall. And I didn't do any of that for the first five years. I was like, oh, I ain't let nobody touch me. No way. And I said, that's probably how I got sick before because I had a tore hamstring. I had a hole in my hamstring. And then it would make your other hamstring pull. And then your back would go out. So I went to a ton of those sports ones and even shady ones. And uh, I probably got really sick from that stuff. And because those people are touching you. Right? It says, touch no unclean thing. If someone's not living holy, man, I'm not going to let them start. They, they, plus, they do reiki, moving energy. And so anyway, I go to this place. And the first week I went there, my son was getting some school year, uh, clothes. It was when he was first starting high school. So he's got to walk around this mall five times. I can't take it. I've been around once. And I just submit myself to this chair massage. And this guy comes in. 
He cracks my neck and cracks my back better than a chiropractor. It was 15 bucks. I felt like a million bucks. I went down to the food court and got some teriyaki chicken and felt great. <laughs> well, there was some grace there, but it was either a setup or it was grace because I felt pretty good. But then he wants to go back now. Now it's the week before school. He remembers the shoes he wants. He wants those shoes. So we go back. I do it again. This time I don't feel so good. Then I look up and I see this triangle. Oh, this, this, this is, this is, uh, this is, uh, uh, when it goes into operation, boy, you put those together, that's the star Ren fam. Oh, man. I don't even want to make it because you'll think I'm anti-Jewish. Oh, I'm pro-Jewish. I'm anti-synagogue of Satan. And uh, they had that triangle on there. And about... And I was like, oh my goodness. All of a sudden I'm getting tighter and tighter. The next day I can't even move. I call Kelly. Arnie. I think I call Arnie to get to Kelly. Arnie, get Kelly. Bring your wife over here. I'm jacked up. I can't move. I'm not lying. I'm not exaggerating. I'm coming down the stairs. Kelly is now manifesting Mike Smith uh, facial expressions. Oh my God. <laughs> and I don't think it's intentional to get my attention. It's real. And I get down there, and she's going to take me to this chiropractor who's a Christian guy, a good guy, all legit. And, and she goes, let me test something to see if this is spiritual. She goes, Lord Jesus, if this is spiritual. So she doesn't come against the demons. She comes to the Father. Many people are coming to demons or attacking demons to see if it's demons. The Father makes all things visible. Lord Show Rick if this is demons or if this is an injury. And for three seconds, it was normal. One, two, back. I go to this place. I go to the guy. He shows me, takes a picture of your spine. He goes, dude, you got no problems with your disc, none of this stuff. It's all fine. But every one of your vertebrae is moving in these different directions. This is odd. Opposite of what I wanted. They were pulled them out of every single direction and I knew the Holy Spirit spoke to me this guy can't help me he showed me my problem but my problem is spiritual I had to go through deliverance for a week straight hours sometimes it would budge but I knew it was real also my neck started moving all of a sudden I could stand up a little straight but this pain it took a long time. Why? Because I was already waging a war against the devil. I had driven out all kinds of kundalini, all kinds of spirits, and they were waiting for me to sit on down into a place where they could cause me pain and hardship. Mm -hmm. And so in return, I got them all out, and my back has been fine ever since then. And not one person has touched my back. I did train my kids. Mm -hmm. They all did it till they're about 18. I taught them how to do foot massages with their heels. And I promised them ice cream or whatever. But, but now I'm on my own. I find gym equipment. People think I'm like an old bear trying to scratch their back. And like, bro, why don't you have your wife do that? Like, my wife's a school teacher. She don't have any energy for this type of stuff. But I don't let people touch me. Now, would I say that a Christian, of course, you know, your family, could there be Holy Ghost people who help people in, in the medical realm and physical therapy? Absolutely. You know, do I think if a guy is psycho and he, he's nuts and he's killed four people, but now he's a and he hasn't been delivered and he's a physical therapist and you're trying to rehab a knee that was tore, are you going to get transfer spirits? No, I believe grace covers that. You know, you're, you're trying to fix your knee. And I think you should be spiritually sensitive, right? But I, I wouldn't be fearful of any of that. I'm not fearful of people. But I'm not looking for some relaxation with some other human being touching my body. That's facts through experience. Any more questions? And then we, we can have a few more. It could be anything to do with deliverance, to you helping people. Do you help in yourself? Because as we end, we'll help ourselves. I feel um, I'm going through a season where I feel really locked, and I do think I'm um, experiencing deception. What? Give me some baby steps, because my relationship with God feels very broken right now. My fault. Okay. 
So, uh, I mean, I, I physically feel like I'm wearing a helmet. Okay. That's kind of true. So I'm not asking for something right now, but I guess some, maybe a few words that might. Well, we always go down to the basics, and, and it says faith. Faith is believing the evidence of the things hoped for, the things not yet seen, right? right. So you're believing the word of God yeah. because it's true, and now you want to see it in your life. And so you have faith. As you follow the Lord, it's going to happen. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God only. So I believe at one point when you're stuck, you got to go back to just you reading the Bible. Okay. At that point, hearing all these sermons, what happens is... There's a little disconnect, and then you do have faith for everybody else but yourself. And yeah, he's experienced it, but this is why A, B, and C, and D, he experiences it. But I'm not experiencing it, so here's another case in point of me being excluded. But when you read the Bible, that's the Lord speaking right back to you. This is, this is spirit, and this is life, and, and it's living. And so you just stick to Mike taught me this too. You got someone stuck, have them read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I've met super stuck people. I mean, people who literally stuck people with knives stuck in jail. And you got to be pretty stuck to be hurting people. And I tell, and the most I ever seen anyone before they snap out of it, I think four times someone had to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John back to back to back to back. Okay. So that's the revelation. Now God is coming down. Before in the Old Testament, he spoke through the prophets, holy men, who spoke to what they heard as the Holy Spirit came down upon them to speak those things. But now God is speaking himself. And so, and just you and the Lord. And you expect to be with the Lord as you're sitting down with him. And then there'll be a, a breakthrough. So if you can't read the Bible then now we have to for sure go through deliverance because he's trying to suck out your power source. Some people will go into, hey, I try to read. We hear it all the time, over and over again. I try to read and I get so tired, full of energy. I drink a cup. It'll be three in the afternoon. Drink a cup of coffee, ready to go. And I'm tired because he's trying to block you from hearing the word of God because that's where the change comes back because it reveals how God feels about you, what God wants to do in you so he can do what he wants to do through you. And he don't want you having that understanding, revelation, and truth. So he sends people off into YouTube land to get another bolt of energy, which someone's full of the Holy Spirit and anointing and you can, boom, feel a little something that can be residual and last you the day that doesn't really change you, but it, tra it trains you also to keep looking for these people to feed off their anointing to get another jolt rather than rebooting the system like you said, where it runs on its own. Just, I don't live oh. there anymore, but I'm talking about going back. Oh, okay. And, um, um, the Lord has separated me from my family. And, um, it's just, uh, but a lot of my family is deceived. And, it's, and um, for years I didn't understand that my mother was having us do things. And, um, you know, putting on necklaces, putting on bracelets, saying different things. And um, just feeding stuff that I thought was normal but wasn't normal. And so I'm trying to just understand the the depths of it, but not I don't have the courage for it. Okay, that's a good one. If you couldn't hear that online, it's she asked, "Hey, uh, my mother was into witchcraft, still involved at a level of witchcraft, imposed it upon me." At some level in my youth, I want nothing to do with it. How do I break it off? Well, the first thing, all demons work with their fuel source, which is fear. Diesels, they move freight with diesel fuel. So in order for them to get back into your life 
or, or to stick around your life, they have to shoot fear. So you have to believe that he was in us is greater than he was in the world, that on the cross of Calvary, he defeated all principalities, powers, dominions, thrones, angels, demons, and every, everything is subjected to Jesus. So you have the power source. So now your first step is you renounce it, right? Lord, I renounce this. I want nothing to do with it. Forgive me for everything I touched. And then, hey, I, I do it uh, with a lot of people. I, I say, hey, renounce the sins of your forefathers. Speak back to that spiritual world. I'm disconnecting myself and apologize to God for what they did. It's just clearing your conscience. It's clearing the slate, knowing that there is no place for you. And then, since it's been around, because that, it seems like it's still around a little bit, because like, oh, I touched this, I wore that, she's still praying this. Is this affecting me? Well, when it's moving around, then every bad thing that happens, it goes, hey, did that come from the witchcraft? Hey, you lost a relationship. Is that from witchcraft? Hey, you didn't get that promotion. That, that sounds like a witchcraft poverty curse, right? So everything, it's speaking, and it's, it's hyper accentuating the fear. And then you're like, oh man, how do I get rid of it? Well, the basics, we're going all the way down. It's always the basics. I repent of my sin. I renounce it. Apologize to the Lord for what my, my family did. I'm clean. The blood of Jesus, it says, washes you white as the snow. You are clean. Now he's just hovering around. Maybe he needs to be driven out. He, he got in your flesh through wearing an amulet or, or some prayer was made and oil was put on your head at five. Well, if he got in the flesh, we're going to drive him out once and for all. But once you know that whom the Son sets free is free, that's facts, that's the will of God, that will be done, he'll, he'll complete it, he began it. Then you go all the way through and then you begin to go into discernment where you can discern, hey, some spirits I learned, I started thinking I still needed a bunch of deliverance because he would come around, especially on Fridays after I'd preach on Thursday. And... He was hammering all these thoughts and, and, and things. I'm a kind of a slow riser. I don't just wake up, boom, going. I'm kind of laying there five minutes, 10 minutes sometimes, half conscious. And he would just be bombarding me. And then in return, I'd get up and go, man, I still got a lot of spirits. Man, they must be manifesting because I was preaching last night. No, I know now it was a spirit that would come by and start just hammering thoughts. And why he was hammering the thoughts, he wanted me to own them like they were still in me. And I'd go, oh, man, I got to do a bunch of deliverance now. I'm tired, man. I just helped everybody else get delivered last night for four hours. But it was now I discerned he was coming and firing those dot, darts. And I know it's facts because I speak to him the night before, and he doesn't rarely show up. If he does try to show up, I rebuke him, and I send him away because he used to be a master. And I know the Bible real good in my heart and my mind, but I'm, I'm not always... Sometimes I'm paraphrasing it. I've messed it up before. I've started things, didn't finish what I was talking about. Happens a bunch. And then he we used to come and start hammering it the night before. And he would start showing me, oh, you messed up there. Well, I was thinking maybe it was the Holy Spirit. I was thinking maybe it was just me. Like, oh, man, I got to correct this. Well, then phase two was in the morning where now it was more sin, right? Thinking about what you used to do. Trying to get me to have that type of mindset. And... Uh, so you got to believe that he wants you free. He's going to finish the, the, the work. Your job is to repent, renounce it, and then drive it all out. Um, what do I do regarding, she like, says like these people who she's consulting, she says like the things that they have told her since I was a child, and she like constantly like feeds that. I probably would have very limited conversations with your mother. Because she's chosen the dark side, right? She's involved in witchcraft. I'm not supposed to have fellowship with darkness. I mean, you need to state your, your faith and say, hey, I'll never stop praying for you. I love you. If you need help, I'll be there. She needs a ride from the hospital. She needs something done in the yard. Feel free. But I can't just be going over to my mom's house that when she's a witch, sitting around eating bunt cakes, talking about the relatives and the weather. You can't do that. Because you're supposed to have no fellowship, even though it's your mother. Now, you always love your mother, and you need to make sure she knows you love her, and that what you're doing is in the name of love, and that you have to protect yourself, and you have to put God before her, that she chose that dark side, because they are going to keep tormenting you. And then they'll try to put guilt on you, so you feel guilty. You know, if someone's not saved, yeah, I think you should go over there and 
and preach and you got to love them and enjoy the kids, the relatives, the cousins, the nephews before you can preach, share some words, some love, some truth. But once they reject it, we don't want that here. You got to let them go. And that's hard. That's hard not showing up for Christmas, your, you know, for pagan holidays. Uh, <laughs> it, it's tough to show up to those when they chose darkness and told you, don't be preaching over here. Right? And, uh, but you have to make, these are sacrifices. It cost you, cost the Lord his son, cost Jesus his life. It cost all these disciples their life. And uh, there's a cost to Christianity. And I can't make people happy and God happy. I can make God happy. I can make the people of God happy. But I can't make sinners happy anymore. Did you say earlier, don't bind? Not in the heavenlies. Not, not, not. Now, if a church is getting together and you want to get the devil out of your church, of course. That's the house that of God. Spirit of depression. Don't bind that spirit. Oh, if she wants, if these people want help. Right? You, you can, you got authority over all these demons. If you want help, you got authority over your demons. If your children, they don't even have to want help if they're under the age of accountability. They just, them demons got to leave your children. They're, they're entrusted to you by God. So they're trespassing. So we have authority over our house, over our body, over people that want help, but I can't come against Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, and those people conjured those demons up, and they want those demons. Now, if they're trying to attack my house, you know, they're out there with some AR-15s. I, I, you know, I'm buying, they're trying to kill me, right? And there ain't no time of talking. They got AR-15. I'm going to bind those demons. They're trying to kill me. And, but I can't come against them as a whole. They, that's who they serve, and that's who they worship. They got free will. The whole Bible, the theme of the Bible is free will. So if people want demons, they can have demons. If people want to be saved, they can be saved. If you don't want to be saved, you don't have to be saved. That's, that's the free will. That's the hard part. When, when you offer someone a gem and a jewel and they treat it like trash, it's, it's hard because we know the value of eternal life. We know the value of Christ's blood. We know the value of prayer. We know the value of deliverance. And some people consider it rubbish. And, and they, they have the right to believe that. So as we close, um, question, more question. go ahead. Quickly. So you said that your friend that was over, um, coming for a deliverance kind of discerned that he had an open door that that demon could possibly be passed on to them. So if people are <clears throat> coming down for deliverance with open doors, can they be susceptible to? To me? No, not to, to you, the demons. Well, I talked about the lady that came in. She was right off the street. The lady picked her up from the bus stop. I mean, she's contorting. She's got blood on her side of her shorts, I saw later, that, you know, that's from injections. You know, she's injecting drugs and whatever you're doing on the street to get money as a homeless person. So God was so merciful. I didn't know who she was. She had been here before, they said, and they had had some success. Her friend that got her said she actually told me about this place. And she was walking in freedom and happened to be driving down the street and saw her and said, I better take you now to the center. So that person was in need of mercy. She didn't really pray much. I mean, them demons are just fighting and contorting. So we're getting to a level of getting them out, right? Before then we need to talk to her and lead her in repentance. One time someone bought, brought in, um, this was the most spookiest person we ever saw. I saw a spooky lady. She came in on a Saturday for deliverance. She ended up shooting a deliverance minister in the head, killing him. She was here on a Saturday, but she wouldn't repent. So Mike said, hey, we can't help you here. And uh, but this other lady looked so spooky. Was little. She was little. And I'm telling you, the eyes were glowing, and I'm not making this up. I'm like, ooh, that's dark over there. So we go over there. There's some people already praying. She's sitting Indian style. She's swinging around like you can't even swing your body. It starts boom, boom, bashing her head on this floor, which is basically a thin little carpet and concrete. Well, I stop it, and I said, hey, 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 stop trying to rebuke those demons. And I said, hey, what's your name? Well, you know, not to the demons, to the girl. 
It's very soft spoken. And I said, hey, are you born again? Are you saved? Have you given your life to Jesus? You need to get saved. Or sometimes they're saved and they got to just repent. But this girl needed to be saved. Then when she called upon the Lord to save her soul, the demon just came out. But someone had scooped her right up off the street. I mean, she was, they were so dark, someone said, hey, unless they come and get delivered, this is, a, this is bad, right? So God is merciful, but we have to get them to repent. If they're Christians, we got to get them to get saved if they're not saved. And a lot of times we assume people are saved because they learned all these Christian sayings, but they've never been saved. By the fruits they produce, you'll know they're saved. So I think you got to kind of go over the basics and say, hey, you need to give your life to the Lord. I don't try to explain to them that I don't think you're saved. I just try to explain to them, I think there's a level that you have not went to of surrendering your life to the Lord and, 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 and being washed in His blood. Because when you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive your sins, count them against you no more, and He'll throw them into the sea of forgetfulness. They don't sound like they're in the sea of forgetfulness. They seem like they're all over you, your sins, because that's what you're talking about. So rather than insult them where they say, no, I know I was saved. My pastor said I was saved. I said the sinner's prayer. So I don't get into that. I just go back to the basics and go over it. So this afternoon, we don't have to go long and hard with, with ministers, people of God like yourself that are moving forward, that are ready to go and help people. Uh, you need to go to the next level, whatever level that is. It's always one thing. So that becomes the stronghold, right? As you start knocking down things that are easy, like, of course, I shouldn't lust. Of course, I, I shouldn't be grumbling and complaining. Of course, I shouldn't be jealous of people. We are knocking all those down, but there's something that becomes harder. But you have to speak to the one thing. That becomes the mountain. The mountain might have many things on it, but the core of that mountain is the one thing. For the rich young ruler, he loved money. And it was what he knew it could do for him. And the love of money is way more powerful than you think because we're raised in the most richest nation in the history of the world. That if you have an automobile and air conditioner and a refrigerator and food, two meals a day, you're in the top 1% of the world. And uh, so we're in such this abundance that we think that we don't love money. Right, But the rich young ruler understood, man, it's hot out here in the desert. If I don't have a slave to fan me with that giant palm leaf, I'm going to be sweating. Hey, it's pretty hard to go take care of my flocks and take care of my fields unless I got slaves to weed it and to water it. Hey, I'm not looking for hard work. And uh, he went away sad. He could have been a disciple. We would have heard his story. He would have had an epistle. He would have had a, uh, you know, we would have heard about him. Right? He would have, Jesus said he would have had riches in heaven, things that would have lasted for eternity rather than the things that were temporal, which he loved, which were just for his lifetime. And so you have to look at it. What, what's been the stronghold? And sometimes it's embarrassing. You don't have to say it. Like deep down, you know, when people will be transparent, that's why you need a cloud of great witnesses, someone you trust. And people, when you trust each other, they'll say, hey, Rick, man, I'll be honest with you. And here the person, from my perspective, is doing good. They're casting out spirits. They're, they're, they're getting some good wisdom. I kind of feel their joy when they come around. Like, oh, man, I, that's a joyful person. I, I kind of feed off that. And there's an anointing to it because I say, hey, I need to adjust my attitude. But then they'll say things like, deep down, I just don't feel worthy. I don't feel I deserve all this. And I know it's biblically not right because none of us are worthy but I just don't feel it and I can't get rid of it. Well, you gotta face that thing head on now. Now that thing is opposing you. Now this is a war. Some things you can just cut off, right? In this world, there's some things you could get rid of easy. Man, we could get rid of taxation. Boy, I would file in that paperwork so fast. If I could get rid of gas costing me money and I could just go there and pump it. I mean, things that are free and that would have this great benefit, you, you would have no problem doing it. I don't want to think negative. I don't want to grumble, complain. I don't want to be in poverty. I don't want these lust thoughts. Some things are very easy just to sign up for God's will and get rid of, but some are harder. That's because they're rooted in there. And a lot of the stuff does have to do with money. 
And it says the love of money is the root of all evil. So if you just love this world, you love your place in this world, and you got a fear that that could be taken away, well, if God did that, I would not be happy. God took this away, man. I, well, that's a root system, and it's talking back to you. And then it has all kinds of residual negativity with you. So our life is not our own. It's been bought with a price. Once your life is your own, then it's up to you to have all the good pleasure that you want. But if it's not your own, it belongs to him, then he's the supplier of all your needs according to his glorious riches which are in heaven. So these are the strongholds to break through. And it's real. I mean, a lot of times I've preached to myself, I almost, sometimes we didn't record things. I wanted to yell in the back, Kelly, you happen to get that recording? I need to play that for myself. I don't do that. But I don't tell people that. I act like, oh, I do that all day long. But I'm like, ooh, that's the word coming out. And now the word's speaking to me. Well, now there's a stronghold because I was deceived. I'm ministering. I'm loving people. I'm helping people. I, I, I've dedicated my life to the Lord. But hey, here's something I'm not doing. Well, now I learn I got to face that. I kind of sometimes when things are hard and they don't come out right away or they're not easy to speak to and just get rid of, it's easy to believe the, oh, okay, well, this will just come out over time. I just got to keep going. I'll keep getting stronger and hey, he'll get weaker and I'll blast him out. No, at one point, the stronger ones, you have to face them head up. And that's what we can do tonight. We're, we got a lot of faith here because we all operate in faith. We all operate in belief and uh, we all want to help people. So the people that have faith and want to help people, man, that's where the Holy Spirit just whoosh, sweeps through the place. And we don't need to go through the uh, big laundry of attack. Let's go to the one because, of course, most of the time with deliverance, you're hitting the smaller spirits, the bad fruit spirits. And then you're working down into the root systems for the person to really get the strongholds uprooted. And, and that's the way it works. But now you might have some residual of these bad fruits, thoughts, negativity, and the devil will go, let's start working out there again and then work our way in. No, as ministers, we can charge right to that thing because that's what's manifesting those bad fruits at a lower level than it was before, but there's some still there. So that's what we can do. And be honest with yourself. You know, be honest with the Lord. Hey, I think some thoughts. And, uh, and things have came upon me that I had to fight later. And I realized, man, I got real sick. I looked at some stuff and it was something where it was like 400 channel at a cabin and also there was some porn on there, you know, HBO porn. And I'm like, whoa, this ain't like HBO 1990s porn. And then a month or so later, I knew to not mess around. I couldn't remember if it, what channels it was at those high numbers, but I knew don't play around. But one day I was slow and it was on Dish Network. Mm -hmm. And it's slow, even when you're hit and change the channel, you get a split second or two. Mm -hmm. And something through that vision came right into my life so powerful. I said, I got to go walk and pray. And I walked down to this river. And when I was coming back, this girl was naked, putting on her bikini, either did it as an exhibitionist, I don't know, or couldn't hear me coming up the back way that thought it's early in the morning. No one's at the river yet. But the devil was manifesting to fuel more, to come in the eye gates, to stir something. So now phase two was harder because I played around with it and I was fighting him. And I took my, my fighting mindset off him. He was fighting me. And now I gave him place, so now it was harder. And it was harder because he was having a grip and he kept saying, man, didn't that feel good? Don't record this part. And didn't that look a lot more fresh and youthful than your wife at, at, at that point in our 40s? I mean, he's hitting me with facts and emotions. And it was a jolt of... He just released some endorphins and they're like, whoo, and it's real. And so some of you've done that now. And, and hey, it happens the most, you know, not to say it's a license to do it. It's, it's please do not do it. It's so, it's a nasty web. But some of you started going through deliverance and you gave place, right? In your case, you, you might have not listened to the conscience going back when there's ambulance and chairs some ladder and mom's calling up witches and I'm over there eating some food. 
I would assume the Holy Spirit said, don't go there no more. You, you eat with, with mom at her favorite restaurant when you can take her out, love her, and share the love of Christ. And if she says, no more Christ, then even the lunches have to stop, right? So we have to fight whether we did it willfully like me or you did it in, in, in spiritual ignorance. Neither one are a pass. And so something now is harder. And then it gets harder to admit. I didn't want to call Mike and go, Mike, I became that guy. Because Michael has called a couple people. Man, he's certified. Certified rebel. And I don't want to call him, Mike, I became a certified rebel. And because I knew everything that I had to do, now I had to do it. And it was harder. Because I had already been free and walked in freedom and walked in helping other people in freedom. So that's what I say we pray to the Lord for. And ask him to take it from us. Where is it all coming from? It's, it's something in the heart. And I had something in my heart. It came as a little kid. I used to ride motorcycles. Man, I would jump these jumps and do all this stuff. I was just adrenaline all my life since I was a little kid, since eight. Trying to get this adrenaline rush. And, and I kind of lived for it. I got street bikes. I'd go 160 miles an hour uh, racing down streets. I hit a car going 100 miles an hour at 16 and crashed. Nothing was a warning. I just was always looking for the adrenaline. Well, that was in my heart where the devil was hyper accentuating uh, a human emotions. Well, obviously I got smarter and realized you can't do those things or your body will be mangled, right? But there was something in my heart yearning for this supernatural dopamine release. So the Lord had to take it away. And now I'm really not looking to be you know, super adrenaline dumped, and I, and I don't really find it. I, I kind of, it's the mindset of Paul. I don't get too excited, and I don't get too low. I kind of just stay in the middle. And uh, so that was a matter of something that got in my heart. The rebellion was saying, hey, do this or that. Push those boundaries. There'll be adrenaline. And uh, we all have to do it. We can do it right now. I'll show you how to do it. Heavenly Father, we come to you this afternoon and we thank you for your word uh, your word is the truth thank you that we're getting to know you and your word and through that process you're setting us at liberty you're setting us free truly the scripture is manifested in our life whom the sun sets free is free and we thank you for it Lord we thank you for it so much that what is birthed in us now is that we want to help other people receive freedom we want to see and experience other people getting that liberty in which you gave us, that you would do it for them. As we know, the scripture is true that if you did it for us, you certainly will do it for them. But Lord, as that's going to happen just fine, Lord, we want to be honest with you. And there's a level inside of us still. And there's a level that, to be honest, Lord, we've even tried to do it with uh, human power. I've, I've tried to out-talk what was spiritual and it doesn't work. I've, I've tried to work it out with uh, good deeds and service to you, and it, it didn't uh, still remain, Lord. And I know it's there. I'm speaking to it, Lord. I'm, I'm confessing it, Lord, today. I apologize for doing it. I, I, I do believe in holiness, and I believe that... Uh, it's through your word and through your Holy Spirit and your presence in our life. We want your presence in our life and we don't want to do anything that upsets you, Lord. We don't want to do anything that's double-minded where we would serve you uh, six days a week and 23 hours and have an hour of sin. We, we want to give no place to the enemy. So I confess this sin, Lord. I've, I've loved money. I've, I've not listened because I've loved people more than you, that I didn't operate in discernment how to help family or friends. And I allowed their spirits to infiltrate me because I stayed too long and I didn't come in your name and didn't stick to the assignment. I apologize for these things, Lord. I've, I've been an adrenaline junkie looking for the next high. It's went over now and as I'm older into materialism, and financial security according to my bank statement and 401k and retirement package. Lord, I want to trust fully in you. I know all things are good. Lord, when they're put in perspective of your word. But anything can be hijacked and where I will not surrender it to you, Lord. 
This afternoon, I surrender to you. I surrender my will. I surrender my sexual character. I surrender my future. I surrender my family. I surrender my finances, Lord. And I said, Lord, you are the Lord of all. You are the Lord of all. All good things come from you, Lord. I want to be free. I've tried to do it in my own power. I've thought of myself less than when the truth was, if I was of myself, I could do nothing. So I didn't need to be anything. I only needed to be shaped and molded and trusted with the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, I repent of nitpicking my own ministry as it sputtered. I've messed up at times. I forgive myself. I've said things I didn't want to say. I've even helped a bunch of people and then hurt a couple people with the things and the attitude I had. Lord, I repent of that, Lord. I'm asking for forgiveness, Jesus. I know that I'm supposed to treat people as my family. I'm supposed to love them as I love myself. I haven't always done it, Lord. I love those who love me back. But your Bible says that what credit is that to me? But I was to love my enemies, and I was to pray for those who misused me and mistreated me. Lord, I repent of that if I've harbored any type of bitterness and resentment in my heart for things that were done to me in the past. I repent of that. I lay it down, Lord, at the cross. I thank you for the precious blood, the power source, Lord, of the renewal, the new birth is the blood. And the blood cleanses, the innocent blood, the sinless blood of you, Lord Jesus, was shed for the remission of my sins so that I could be forgiven, so that I could get a second chance, Lord, as ministers, we're ministers of the second chance. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm speaking back to that depression. I'm speaking back to that poor self-worth. I'm speaking back to any witchcraft in the bloodline or occult of my past. I'm speaking back to you in the name of Jesus. Now, this is when you're intentional. Feel free to use your lips. You're not on camera. I speak back to you in the name of Jesus. You are not coming into my ministry. You are not coming into my ministry. You are not coming where I'm going. You will only try to lead me astray. I speak back to you, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ. I speak back to you in the name of Jesus. I command you, take your hands off me in the name of Jesus Christ. Take your hands off me in the name of Jesus. Shame, condemnation, loneliness, guilt, shame. Come out of there right now. Love of money, love of pleasure. In the name of Jesus, the Son of God. Speak back to him. Speak back to him. You told me my sons and daughters wouldn't be saved. You told me I wouldn't be healed. You lied in the name of Jesus. You told me I couldn't do it. I speak back to you in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. I command you to take your hands off me. Take your physical exhaustion. Take your physical exhaustion. Take your addictions and go in the name of Jesus, the Son of the living God. Come out of there right now asthma, emphysema, all that sickness. This is offense unto me. Come out of there right now. Crohn's disease, Lyme's disease. Come out of there right now. Come out of there. Demons messing with my endocrine system, my hormones, my adrenal function. Come out of there right now in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. Demons that word cursed me in my youth, telling me I was fat, telling me I was stupid, telling me I'd be a loser, telling me about my IQ. I speak back to you in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. I cancel your assignment. I command you to be uprooted right now, to be undammed right now in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit power. Speak to him in the name of Jesus. Come out of there. Transfer spirits. Transfer spirits. I bind your power. Come out of there. Demons hindering my breakthrough. Demons hindering my breakthrough. Demons hindering my faith. Come out of there in the name of Jesus. Come out of there. You have to go. It's not an option. 
It's not an option. I speak back in the name of Jesus. I speak back in the name of the Lord Jesus. I command every false spirit, every kundalini spirit, every narcissistic, selfish spirit, I speak back to you in the name of Jesus. Streamers, all you have to do is speak back to them. Don't stop when they're just yawning. Speak back to them until he comes out. That's his supporting cast. You're getting the weaker ones out first. In the name of Jesus, I speak back to the mountain. In the name of Jesus, devil, you are the mountain. And when I speak back to you, you shall be removed. It's not you might be removed down the road. You shall be removed in the name of Jesus. You shall be removed. Devil, you, mu you must go. Come out of there right now. This woman is not cursed. You told her she was cursed. You tried to block her how to see her family saved. And I know every one of these witchcraft spirits tries to choke Christ. Come out of there from Christ flowing through her. Come out right now. Come out of there right now. I break witchcraft curses. I break entanglements with the occult. Come out. Come out of there. Come out of there. Fear of the devil. Fear of witchcraft. Come out of there right now. There is no fear in love. God so loved this woman that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to become sin for her, that she might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is the liberty in whom the son sets free is free. Come out of there. All the witchcraft, I separate it one from another. I bind your power to resist. Come out. Come out. Witchcraft sickness. Witchcraft fatigue. Witchcraft deception. Come out of that body. Witchcraft deception. Come out of there. Mind binders. Come out of there. Mind binders. Come out of there. In the name of Jesus. Come out of there. Anger. Anger at myself. Anger at myself because I didn't do everything I knew I should have done. Oh, that's where grace steps in, devil. Oh, that's where grace covers a multitude of sin. Come out right now. Come out. Grace covers that sin. Come out right now. Condemnation. You come out right now. For there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Come out right now. Come out. Come out. I come against the condemner. I come against the condemner in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. Come out of there. Shame for not saying the right things. Shame for not putting in the right work according to the scriptures. Faith for not saying the right things. Come out of there right now. That's where grace covers. That's where God shapes and molds and makes new. Come out of there right now. Come out of there. Fear of people that she loves going to hell. No. She loves them. We are always going to see good fruits and change because we love God. Let your tears go. Let them go. Let those tears go. Come out. I'm not sick. I'm not sick anymore. I'm not sick anymore. I'm not cursed anymore. I'm blessed. And you cannot curse what the Lord has blessed. This woman has been blessed with finances. She's been blessed with a gift of favor. Favor with man and favor with God. To be able to sell, to buy, to help, to build up and not tear down. I bind the tear downs. I bind the tear down spirits. Come out right now. I bind the tear down spirits that want to tear down what God has built. I bind the demons that want to tear down what the Lord has built. Take a big breath. Let all that guilt go. Let all that guilt go. Take a big breath. You got the anointing now. All the lies in my mind that constantly point out my insufficiencies. All those devils that point out my is insufficiencies and deficiencies. I speak back to this spirit right now. Come out of there. You've held her back. And God says, come as we are. As we follow him, the shaping and the molding happens. As the ten lepers followed the word of God, they were all made well. You are trying to tell her not to move forward because of her inadequacies and deficiencies. No, the Lord is calling her to green pastures. He's calling her to the still waters. There's the restoration of her soul. There's the restoration of the marriage. There's the restoration of the fire of the marriage. The excitement of the two becoming one flesh before the eyes of God and through the study of God. Thank you for the anointing, Lord, of the Holy Spirit on these women for good works, for the service of Christ. Thank you for that protection that comes through the Holy Spirit, that there's a protection that they don't have to fear, that the wicked one cannot penetrate, even though he wants to, because your hand of protection is over them as they're ambassadors of the light. Oh, and the light will always expose the darkness. And now we deal with any darkness. 
and we eradicate it and evict it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the joy of the Lord. And thank you, Lord, for the joy, Lord, that everything this woman is called to do in Christ is to do, do it through a position of joy, not out of obligation, not out of a debt that was owed, but out of a joy that comes through the knowledge of Jesus Christ and his presence in her life. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for sending the joy of the Lord to be your strength. I speak back to the dry bone spirit that wanted to dry up these vertebrae, that wanted to dry up these ligaments and joints, that wanted to dry up the vitality in which you've given this woman for a vital a vital life, an energy-filled life. I speak back to you in the name of Jesus. I speak back to the spirit of dry bones. Come out of there. You make the knees tight. Come out of there right now. Come out of there. You make the knees tight. Come out of there right now. Arthritic effect upon the, boy, the jo boy, bones and ligaments and joints. Come out. Come out of there. Come out of there. I'm commanding you to take your hands off this body. The aches and pains, you've told her, hey, it's because you're this age of your life, you should just expect it. No, we do not have to expect what the world has to suffer through because the Lord makes all things new. He'll bring vitality and youthfulness to the bones. Thank you, Jesus. Come out of there right now. Come out. Take a big breath. Let that stuff go. Let that pain go. He told you you deserved it for all the years of what you were doing. Oh, we don't get what we deserve. Because God intervened with mercy and he triumphed over judgment. Now we can receive the blessings. All the answers to your prayers are yes and amen. There you go. Get him out. He's a dry bone spirit. Come out of there. He's trying to talk reason to you. He's trying to talk human reasoning while your body's not healed. No, it's a dry bone spirit. He wants your bones dry. He wants your joints dry. He wants your, your body aching in pain. Come out of there right now. Aches and pains. Lord, thank you for the prayers that were prayed for him. Thank you for the prayers he prayed for himself. That they come down right now to bear good fruit. Now this spirit, the whisperer, I command the whisperer to come out. The whispers anger. The whisper, whispers frustration. You start and you start building in his life with your demonic evil with a whisper. I uproot the whisper right now in the name of Jesus. Come out of my head. You whisper negativity. You whisper guilt. You whisper calamity. I break you in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. Just take two coughs, sir. Get it going. Use your faith. Come out of there, whisperer. Come out of there. There you go. Stop whispering to me negativity. Drive him out till he goes. Come out. Drive him all the way out till he goes. Saints, drive him out till he goes. You get stuck, you let your tongues rip. I speak back to the mountain. Don't get sidetracked, streamers. Speak right back to the mountain. I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to you specifically in the name of Jesus. I'm speaking to you to take your hands off my life. Oh, you've tried to put your hand on this woman's life. That she would be a desire of this world. She'd be an object of affection to the men of this world. But you called her out of this world into the glorious light of Jesus Christ. And I know you're doing to her what you did to me. There was a subtle whisper always in my mind that Christianity was the second best. That all the fun and all the good times were in sin and were with the people of the world. And that believing of the lie led me to have one foot in the world and one foot in Christ. Ah, you were exposed. I know who you are. I've seen you before, devil, in my own life. And I come against you right now in the name of Jesus, the spirit of the world, the drunk drunkenness of this world, the being led astray of this world, the root systems of this world. I command you in the name of Jesus to take your hands off this woman of God. Ah, there's no peace in this world. Ah, there's no prosperity like the prosperity of the Lord in which he protects. Oh, there's no true fellowship and friendship with the world as there is with the body of Christ who loves unconditionally. As the world will only love us conditionally, uh, you are exposed by the light of Christ. I bind your power now. In the name of Jesus, the spirit of the world. No, she's been called and separated for the Lord and his purposes. And she's called to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come out right now. Demons that came in through the eye gates, through the ear gates, through the lower loins of the body. We shut the door on you and we speak to you in the name of Jesus, commanding you to come out. 
Just take two big coughs. Get him moving. Get him moving. If that's true, drive him out. Hey, God bless. Thank you for coming. God bless you, sisters. Come out. Get him out now. Come out. He's going to send those fast talkers to you. He's going to send the elixir of the world. Unless you drive out the root system, it won't have any place to root up. Drive him out. You'll see so many wonderful things the Lord will do through you, your ministry, helping people, your own family, your own life. Oh, you got to fight for it now. Fight for it. Fight for the Spirit of Christ. Fight for the Holy Spirit to have His full way in your life. Come out of there right now. All the spirits that infiltrated through past relationships. I'm commanding you to come out. Soul ties with men in whom she loved, but they didn't love her back. They didn't love her with the love of Christ. I forgive those men in who I gave myself to. I gave my heart. I gave my emotions. I gave my body. I forgive them for being takers and giving nothing in return. I forgive them and I release their spirits. There it goes. Come out. Spirits of the past lovers. Come out. There he goes. Spirits of the past lovers. Get him out. It causes bitterness. There you go. Drive it right out. Drive it right out. I drive you out. The spirit of my past lovers. The spirits of my last boyfriends. I command you to come out right now. Ungodly soul ties. Ungodly soul ties with the world. Come out right now. Ungodly soul ties with the world. Come out. The ungodly soul ties with the world. Come out right now. Come out. That fascination with social media. That fascination of people being appreciative of her earthly beauty. Come out right now. Come out of there right now. That's the spirit of the world. He came with the soul tie. And he's re reminding you of the romance and the feelings that you wouldn't leave him. Come out right now. I don't care what feelings I had in the past. You left me dry and empty, naked and poor. I command you. I will not serve you anymore. You are a spirit of the world. You are the spirit of that man. Come out right now. Come out. Oh, it's time. It's time that their prayers go to another level of faith. It's time for the presence of God to come into their house, into their family, into their ministry, into their finances, to another level. Come out, any spirit that would block them from the other level. That they would say, I don't want to bite off more than I can chew. I don't want to get too deep and not understand how to operate at that level. You are a liar, a distractor, a discourager. In the name of Jesus, I come against the liar, the distractor, the discourager. In the name of Jesus, come up out of that body. Come up out of that body. Come up out of that body. Every devil that told this man that he can't, you're a liar. Every devil that told him he cannot do it. Every devil that told him it wasn't possible. Come out right now. Through Christ we can do all things. Through Christ all things are possible. All things are possible for them that believe God. All things are possible for them that believe God. The problem wasn't with God, it was with our belief in God, our trust in God. Come out of there right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Streamers, speak back to him. If you can't pray in tongues to break through, just start praising him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You can go to another level of cleaning the temple. You can go to another level of the purification. Uh -oh, you can go to another level of sanctification. It all goes hand in hand with your freedom. But if you bring the demons, oh, they're always going to infiltrate. They're always going to corrupt. They're always going to defile. You give no place to him. You give no place. You don't say, hey, I did enough right now. Uh, I'll get the rest later. Give no place to the devil. No, I hate your guts, devil. I hate the fruits of sin. I hate the fruits of demons. I speak back now. In the name of Jesus, the Son of God. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I give you, Lord, my whole heart. I give you my whole life. I thank you, Lord. I can trust you. You'll never give me temptation more than I can find the door of escape. Oh, you never put a burden on me that I couldn't handle. You said, come to me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light and that we find rest for our souls. Oh, thank you, Lord, for the strength, the strength of the living God, the strength of the Holy Spirit, the strength of your word. Thank you, Lord, that I can go 
Lord, further and further into the light. And as I go further into the light, all things become visible. The darkness begins to be exposed. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for exposing the darkness. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for exposing the darkness. Lord, you've given me the spiritual eyes to see. The first thing you do is reveal the light. And then you reveal the darkness as we choose the light. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving me when I was shady. You said, if light be in you and darkness, how great is the darkness. Lord, I want no darkness in my life, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that that's a sign of being free as I'm moving further into light, to the light and I can see the darkness and I can war against the darkness. Thank you, Jesus. I want nothing to do with the fruits of darkness. Thank you for helping me, Lord. Thank you for having your way with me, Lord Jesus, shaping and molding me, making me the man and the woman of God that you created me to be. Thank you for it, Lord. I represent you, Lord. I'm an ambassador. I'm an ambassador in this sin-stained world. I'm in the world. I'm, I'm not of the world. Thank you that I'm an overcomer. I'm overcoming the wicked one. I'm overcoming myself. I'm overcoming the wiles of the devil. I'm shutting the door that I don't have to live in the torment. Thank you, Jesus. I don't have to live in the shame. I don't have to live in the condemnation. I don't have to live in the regret. I don't have to live in a busted relationship. I don't have to live with mental illness. I don't have to live with a sick body. I don't have to live in financial destitution. I don't have to live broke, in debt, a slave. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to do what King Asa did. I'm going to get rid of the devil. I'm going to rebuild my life, restructure my life. I'm going to build a fortified city. I'm going to do what the word commands me to do so the enemy can't get back in. Can't get back in an open door. Can't get in a back door. I'm going to fortify the city, giving no place to the enemy. And thank you that through that, a sign that I've done it is I'm going to prosper. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that I'm going to prosper. Thank you, Lord, that I'm going to have to go through a test. And as I go through the test, it's going to allow me when I pass to go to another level. And as, as I keep going through tests and I keep getting raised up to other levels, I cannot take my foot off the gas. I cannot trust in myself. I cannot trust in man. Although you speak through holy men of God, you speak through teachers, pe preachers, and evangelists. Lord, I'm not going to trust in a man, a man of the world, a man of this world system. I'm going to trust in you so I can keep being raised up time and time again till I see you face to face on that day. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, streamers.